We are now live on the web. Testing, one, two. Councillor Carmel, are you able to hear us? We're just, Councillor. I, I can hear you, but nobody else. I don't. Uh, can you hear me, Councillor Carmel? Now I can hear you, yeah. Okay. All right, we're just about to start the meeting. Okay. All right, I would like to, uh, are we ready? We're good to go. Okay. I would like to call this meeting to order. At this time, I would like to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional land of Treaty 6 territory and acknowledge the diverse indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as Cree, Dene, Sotu, Blackfoot, and Kodasu, as well as Métis and Inuit, and now settlers from around the world. Uh, we'll do a roll call of council members. Uh, Councillor Wright. Good morning. Councillor Knack. Good morning. Councillor Prince Bay. Good morning. Councillor Stevenson. Good morning. Councillor Paquette. Good morning. Councillor Tang. Good morning. Councillor Hamilton. Good morning. Councillor Rutherford. Hello. Councillor Salvador. Good morning. Councillor Cartmel. Good morning. Councillor Rice. Good morning. And Councillor Jans. Good morning. All right, adoption of the agenda. Councillor Hamilton? Yeah, I'll move that the April 4th, 2023 City Council meeting agenda be adopted with the following changes. The addition of item 9.1, contract update, and replacement report on item 10, motions pending. Okay. And for uh, item 10, motions pending, Councillor Rice is going to make an inquiry instead of a motion. So uh, that's the reason for replacement report. Uh, we need a seconder. Second. Councillor Rice seconded it. Okay, uh, please vote. Yes. 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 Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. Uh, ad approval of the minutes. Councillor Nack. Yes, thank you, Mayor Sohi. I will move the approval of the minutes from the March 13th, 2023 City Council public hearing and the March 14th, 15th, 2023 City Council meeting. Okay, uh, need a seconder? Second. Second. Councillor Tang, uh, any errors or omissions in the minutes? Seeing none, please vote. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Jones.
Yes. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Uh, protocol items. Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm sorry I can't be joining you all in chambers, but I'm very delighted this morning um, to recognize the great work being done in the city of Edmonton's Blatchford community. This innovative community was recently celebrated at the national level uh, and more recently has been recognized locally as well. So on March 18th, the Canadian Home Builders Association Edmonton Region gave Blatchford top honors at their 2023 Awards of Excellence in Housing. Blatchford won the Best New Community uh, category, which recognizes a residential development for its innovative concepts of land use, its current and future amenities, and its environmental initiatives. Blatchford is an ambitious land development project in the heart of our city, a project that supports and advances several of the city plan's goals, including building a healthy city, creating vibrant urban places, and transitioning to a low carbon future. Blatchford is an example of the city working towards a climate and socially resilient future and is not going unnoticed. Uh, what is most meaningful for me about uh, both of the, the national and local city community awards is that these awards aren't for planning or hypotheticals. They are for actual implementation of an exceptional community. So the award demonstrates that the Blatchford concept of a sustainable neighborhood is truly a reality and an outstanding one at that. So I'd like to take this time to recognize uh, City of Edmonton staff whose work has made this award possible. Uh, please stand if you are joining uh, uh, in chambers today. So Tom Lumsden, Cheryl Mitchell, Neil Upshaw, Danny Tran, Lauren Bridges, Mel Garcia, Oprah Matara, Jolene Elmore, Christian Felsky, Samir Baines, Daniel Albercant, and Isaac, Isaac Bryson. Uh, please join me in congratulating this fantastic team. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, thank you, everyone, and nice to see you uh, in the chamber hall. Uh, keep up the good work. Uh, any other protocol items? Okay, seeing none. Uh, select items for debate. Select items for debate. Uh, here we go. I can, st I can start. Uh, I would like to exempt 8.1. 8.2. Eight point six and we need to exempt nine point one okay. Okay. those by bylaws for voting purposes? Uh, no, I have some questions, yeah. I have questions on those bylaws. Okay, Councillor Rice. I would like to select 8.1 so that... 8.1 already exempted. You, you selected, yeah, yeah. and you also selected 8.6, right? Uh, yes, I have selected 8.6. So 8. I'd 6. like to select 8.2 and 8.4. 8.2, 8 8.4. Okay. All right. And for, for voting purpose. For us, so it's 8.2 and 8.6. Sorry, 8.4. I think that's really important. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Seeing none, we will carry on to, uh, can someone move the balance, I'll move please? The Councillor Nack. Second. Councillor uh, Tang, move the balance. Uh, please vote.
Yes. Thank you, Councillor. Yes. Councillor, thank you, Councillor Carmel. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Yes. Thanks, Councillor Rutherford. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Can you I'll go to clerk? Can you please uh, let us know what we have already approved? Thank you, Mayor. So, he, council, this board, the council this morning has approved the following reports. Item 5.1, uh, the advisory committees of council. The policy review is now coming back to council on June 13th. It also approved the following three public reports. 7.1, the joint use agreement land review update. 7.2, residential tenants and mobile homeowners, provincial requirements and standards coming from Community and Public Services Committee, as well as the Edmonton Arts Council grants and investments for 2023. Okay. Thank you. Request to speak. We don't have any request for specific time on agenda. None. Vote on bylaws not selected for debate, uh, which is 8.5, 8.7, and 8.8 and 8.9. Okay, Councillor Cartmel. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. I'll move first reading as of items 8.5, 8.7, 8.8, 8.9. .8 Second. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Please vote. In favor. Thanks, Councillor Jones. It's not coming up for me, I'm a yes. Thanks, Councilor Rutherford. Yes for me as well. Thank you. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor so he'll move second reading of items 8.8 .8 and 8.9. Second. Okay, please vote. Sorry, we are gonna have, please vote, yeah, please vote. Councillor Jones? Yes. Thank you. We've all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor Sohi, I'll move consideration of third readings of items 8.8 .8 and 8.9. Second. Thank you. Uh, please vote. Yes. Thanks, Councillor Jones. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor Sohi, I'll move third and final reading of bylaw 20374 and bylaw 20367. Okay. Second. Please vote. Yes. Thanks, Councillor Jones. We have all the votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. Councillor inquiries. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. So the inquiry is. Um, that the city clerk bring a report to council service committee summarize roles and responsibilities of council advisors for advisory committees and the list of all council appointments to all city and external agencies uh, council members only not public members identify which are decision making versus advisory non-voting appointments Thank you, Councillor Rice. Any other inquiries? Seeing none, uh, reports to be dealt with at a different meeting, none. Request to reschedule, reports, none. Uh, unfinished, sorry? Request to reschedule reports? We already done that, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
uh, unfinished business none. Public reports we dealt with 7.1, 7.2, 7.3. Now we are going to go into bylaws, right? And I exempted 8.1, and I'll ask Councillor Stevenson to take the chair, please. I have the chair. Okay. Thank you. So I have a couple of questions uh, on, the, on the borrowing by law. One is the, the timing of borrowing. Uh, Adam, can you... Uh, give some sense uh, actually on the I, time. I think Gord would be better positioned okay. to respond to this one for because I want to understand the 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 amount the our borrowing capacity kind of fluctuates or up goes up then comes down. Just want to understand that in that context. Right. Like what are the timing is for the borrowing on these Gord, Gord do you this is the LRB replacements Gord? Yeah. So this will be contingent upon uh, when we were able to place the first orders. So we were connecting in with uh, some of the other orders uh, tied to the longer term capital works. So we're working with that as well. So that will really be um, done in conjunction with, with uh, the other replacements. So that coordination will determine when we have to uh, actually borrow the money, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah, Good. we want to place one one large order as opposed to individual smaller orders. Right, right. Okay, does that also present opportunities, uh, that coordination for us to be working with other municipalities uh, in in any in any way uh, to kind of have that bulk purchase or, uh, uh, you know, power in having... Uh, I, I guess there is potential. Uh, a lot of it would depend on what uh, other jurisdictions are doing and, and what they're ordering and who they're ordering from. So there is potential, but there would be a lot of considerations. Perhaps Adam might add a little okay. bit more. To yeah, that. we did engage with the City of Calgary to look at options for bulk purchasing, but timing didn't really work out. And okay. fleet requirements between City of Edmonton and City of Calgary are different. Okay. And so we did look at that. Uh, certainly we looked at it when we were... Um, developing the LRT program, but again, it was just timing was off for the two cities. Okay, got it. Okay, that, that's that's good information. Because the reason I'm asking is that, but any opportunity to reduce the need for expenditures, which reduces the need for borrowing, right? So that's why. Good. Okay, and the, and the, and the timing of borrowing. Yeah. And Mr. Mayor, just tentatively, we're we're anticipating around the 2025 mark uh, as the borrowing date. Okay, then gradually kind of grow, uh, ex uh, uh, expanding the money as we purchase more LRBs. Correct. Okay, got it. Okay, good. Thank you. That's all. That's all I needed to know. And I, uh, and I go to Councillor Stevenson for to resume the next of the proceeding. Um. If no question, I can move the. Uh, the bylaw. Great. Any other questions? Second. Over to you then, MG. Uh, Mayor Sohi. I move the bylaw. Second. Thank you. Please vote. In favor. Thanks, Councillor Jones. We have all the votes, Deputy Chair. Please display the vote. And that is carried. And that was just for one reading today, so I'll pass the chair over to Mr. Mayor. Okay. And next one will go, to, I'll take the chair back. And next one is uh, 8.2, exempted by Councillor Rice, uh, bylaw 20392. For, is that for voting purposes only, Councillor Rice, right? Okay. All right, so when someone needs to move this to Councillor Salvador, you want to do that? Yeah. Um, so I'll move first reading of bylaw 20425. Okay. Need a second? Second. Uh, can we say, sorry, can we please? 392. Over. Thank you. <laughs> 20392. Yes. Yeah. Second. Okay. Second. Second by Councillor Tang. Okay, okay, we have a bylaw on the floor. Uh, 
Anyone to speak? Okay, Councillor Rice. Uh, okay, sorry. Please vote. We have all the votes. Let's play the votes, please. That is carried. Uh, I exempted 8.3, and I'll ask Councillor Stevenson to take the chair. I have the chair. Okay. So, my question is, uh, and I raised this at the, uh, when we talked about the uh, Velbedir CRL, right, about the uh, uh, lack of um, uptake in the, in, in the growth, right? And uh, these are neighborhoods in the close proximity to that, right? Uh, again, looking at the schedule of borrowing and connecting to the CRL, that borrowing and opportunities for coordination on the work uh, and bundling of, that's what I wanna kind of understand uh, how this, uh, Revitalization is connected uh, to the uh, to the overall potential of that neighborhood and CRL. So these types of improvements um, uh, are, are not sort of in that same stream as CRL investment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're more related to um, from the work of neighborhood revitalization, looking up looking at opportunities to improve public realm within community. Yeah. So uh, I'm not sure if all of these initiatives actually fit within the CRL boundary. Uh, but in, in, in terms of your question related to when we choose to borrow, um, I think Mr. Rye is on the call, Harm is on the call, but we don't borrow until we 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 need the dollars in place. Yeah. So um, it's 22 million we wouldn't borrow the 22 million immediately. It would be phased on the basis of the project and how it progresses. Yeah, so when the project starts at that time, you borrow, today's authorization to borrow, right? And uh, but scheduling depends on the construction starts. So I, okay, having a better understanding of the timing of that, right? And uh, how it pays, right? And, uh, and also the, because that area needs attention. Uh, absolutely, right? And uh, I fully support the uh, reconstruction and revitalization, and I'm fully committed to a CRL as well, but just trying to look for opportunities for more coordination, having a more of a holistic approach for the neighborhoods. Yeah, so certainly that'll happen between yeah. uh, any development prospects that would be coming through our, our partners in UPE yeah. and the revitalization work we have here, and we'll make sure that it's coordinated, and again, we, we have, a, we have a, a general cash flow of what that borrowing would look like, but we do need to complete design, which is why the, the first year is, is a, a smaller amount. And the decision to borrow more will be based on exactly that. What do we project to complete over, over the budget cycle that's identified? Okay. So it would be staged in a way where uh, we're maximizing uh, or minimizing maybe the um, strain on the, on the on the debt portfolio that we have at the city. Got it. And the the cost of borrowing, at what rate we borrow, is also determined at a time when we actually do the borrowing, right? That's correct. So um, I'm probably stepping into a space where I shouldn't, so maybe Harm would like to touch on the sort of strategically how we approach the borrowing. Yes, that's a, that, you had that right, Adam, and uh, uh, Mayor Sohi. So we, we kind of borrow um, as expenditures are incurred, so to make sure we're not borrowing too much in advance, so kind of making the cash flows of expenditures. Um, and yeah, and, and we will borrow at the rate um, the rate that's in effect at the time of borrowing. So it, it could change based on when we, uh, when we actually uh, take on the borrowing, but it's the rate effective at the time of borrowing. Okay. Got it. Okay. All right, those two questions I had, I'll take the chair back. And I'll go to Councillor Prince Bay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. I have a question specifically for this um, revitalization project. Is it is the design of the project set? 
can there be any changes? Uh, some of the designs have been completed, but the, uh, I believe there's an uh, open space project that we're going to be starting hopefully in 2023. Um, but we're, we're early in design, so what we have are essentially concepts and, and they're they're being firmed up as, as as the project was approved. Okay, great. So there still can be further discussion That's correct. on that. Okay, great. Thanks. And just a general question now about neighborhood revitalization, the cost sharing. When when did the city start with cost sharing or like the whole process of neighborhood revitalization and cost sharing? This isn't cost sharing. Um, oh, the, sorry. No, you're right. The revitalization isn't. I'm thinking renewal. <clears throat> Correct. Yeah, yeah. So sorry about that. Um, so I'll just uh, speak to you offline then about any kind of decision. For sure. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Principal. Councilor Rutherford? Oh, sorry, Councilor Rutherford, hold on for a minute. Uh, we have some guests with us. Oh. Uh, we are, uh, have kids from here, uh, grade, grade six. Holy Cross with their teacher, Miss B. Mantle, Mantle Honor, and ward is Nikura Iska, and your ward representative is Councillor Knack. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Are you here for, uh, as part of the uh, City Hall School or uh, just for one day? Just for a day? Okay. Well, enjoy, have fun, and uh, you can stay as long as you want to watch our council meeting. Uh, otherwise, we'll see you in the, uh, in, in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, around here in the rest of the city hall. Good. Thank you for joining us. Okay. Sorry, Councillor Rutherford, please go ahead. Yeah, I just had a follow up question. I know during the budget, um, you know, we just when we were discussing this revitalization project, we talked about um, Inglewood coming in under budget. Am I correct in my re recollection? Um, under the revitalization program, I'm not sure. Uh, I can't recall that, Councillor Rutherford. I'm just going to see if uh, someone on the line has that information. I guess my question just to also speed up the questions is, will there be a subsequent boring bylaw that reduces reduces that? Um, so for any borrowing that we do for the different capital projects we have, this is uh, if we don't borrow, uh, as, as Harm mentioned, we don't borrow uh, as a lump sum, we borrow as required. And mm -hmm. so uh, we're, we, you know, if a project does um, uh, come in under what we have projected in terms of borrowing requirements. We simply wouldn't borrow, but maybe Harm can speak to the specifics on that. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting because I've definitely seen bylaws come back with a reduction in borrowing amounts. Yeah, no, um, uh, Madam, you, you have that correct. So, uh, uh, Council Rutherford, we we kind of wait till the end of the project when the project completion, and if there is uh, any debt that we didn't require that we had initially authorized in the bylaw, we typically would, would come back at some point and kind of do a cleanup and kind of reduce the borrowing authority under that bylaw. So it's more of a more of a cleanup exercise. Um, yeah. Yeah, and so the reason I'm asking this in relation to the Bowen Belvedere is because. You know, if we're approving 22 million, but let's say Inglewood came in under budget by 5 million, really what we're borrowing is less than 22 million once we revise the Inglewood one. If I'm thinking about just revitalization buckets, is my conceptualization correct? Yeah, that's that's correct. On 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 a, a, like taking a step back at the comprehensive picture, yeah, we're only going to borrow what we actually need. So we wouldn't have been borrowing that five million that we came under for Inglewood. Yeah, exactly. Inglewood. Yeah. Okay, so I can ex we can expect to see that because I know there's still some some loose ends to be tied up. I understand that project's not fully completed, but it's getting close. So I just wanted to flag that and and see you know as we're as we're thinking about debt, and I know we're we're very mindful of our debt borrowing that that's something to, to factor in. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. So that concludes the questions. Uh, uh, 
Councillor Paquette, think, sorry. I think, Councillor Paquette, do you want to move the bylaw? Oh, sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I will move bylaw. This is your ward, right? Second. This is his ward. Oh, this is, yes. oh, sorry. Well, so, it's, it's myself and Council Principal. Oh, uh, <laughs> okay. Okay, Councilor uh, uh, Principal, you can second that? Okay. I'll oh, second that. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Who moved it? Councilor uh, uh, again moved it. Okay. okay. All right. No, it's okay. I, re I rescind my second. Okay. Yeah, so just we heard two seconds, or Mr. Mayor. Councilor Principal seconded it. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so we have anyone to speak? Okay, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Uh, now we go to 8.4, uh, exempted by Councillor Rice for voting purposes only, bylaw 20426 to authorize the City of Edmonton to undertake construct finance up integrated infrastructure service supply energy center number four, Blatch for renewable energy. Any, anyone have questions? Councillor Stevenson. Just to move the, the bylaw. Okay, can you please move the bylaw? Uh, I move that bylaw 20426 be read for first time. Okay, need a seconder. Second. Councillor Nack. All right, anyone to speak? Seeing none, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And I exempted 8.6. Councillor Stevenson, can you take the chair, please? I have the chair. Good. So my question is around, uh, you know, there was very good news last week uh, that you announced about uh, uh, the Blatchford LRT towards uh, getting into Blatchford uh, uh, ahead of schedule, which is uh, good news. Uh, can you confirm that? Um, I, I would say that we're progressing well. Progressing well, okay. Oh, you want to always be more cautious, come on. <laughs> uh, and my question is because if that did, when we made that decision in the budget time to uh, uh, do this preliminary work and the land purchases, were we keeping that timeline in mind? Because I want to understand again timing for the borrowing and and if there's a way to expedite that process to uh, get it going faster, recognizing that the, the line will open potentially quicker than we projected. So the borrowing for this is the land for the future yeah. extension. Mm -hmm. um, land acquisition doesn't have kind of a defined schedule for it. It's really opportunity-based purchases, and so it would really be a function of um, the opportunities that present itself along the line. So if, if the desire was to accelerate, we would go into the expropriation kind of realm of, of the land acquisition, and I, I would suggest we wouldn't recommend that because we haven't got formal approval of the project right, okay. uh, to carry forward. So, so this is really uh, funding to allow us to um, advance opportunity purchases that are along the line to have conversations with different property owners that we've had conversations with the past to, to see if they're interested in, in selling for the future LRT line. So it's very tough to accelerate this because it is opportunity based. Oh, I see. So you're going to just follow the, the process, and uh, that's correct. Okay. And the borrowing will require as you negotiate. Yeah. So I mean, we've really back end loaded this cash flow to the end of uh, of the budget cycle. 
Um, but I would suspect just based on the time frames that it takes to secure land, especially on an opportunity basis, this borrowing, we could see it being extended or the requirement for the, the borrowing being extended into future, uh, the next budget cycle, just because of the time it takes to secure opportunity purchase of land. Got it, okay. Okay, maybe I got, maybe I got excited too, too soon. <laughs> uh, well, it's good to get excited about an LRT line opening. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I think for the metro extension, yeah. there's a, not not to be sort of the rain cloud, but there's a big crossing that we got to figure out before we can sort of look oh, at yes, the Oh, yes, of course. It's, it's, not a, it's not an easy project, right? But, you know, uh, uh, look forward to uh, further discussions on this. Okay. Uh, I will take the chair back, and I'll go to Councillor Prince Bay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, when I read this report, I didn't, in my recollection, when we, um, when this passed at budget, it was actually just to go to uh, Castle Downs, not to Campbell Road. And in the report that I read here, I always see it in reference to Campbell Road. So my concern is that we might be doing land acquisition past Castle Downs. I just want to make sure that we're going to be focusing on up to Castle Downs. Um, actually, no. Uh, we we uh, included this on the premise of the entire LRT line and the land acquisition, again, being opportunity purchase base, that it would be anywhere from, um, call it north of the CN tracks to the end of the, the line that's been approved by council. Um, so we, we have proceeded on that basis that it's opportunity purchase for the entire line. Yeah, that, that's my concern when I read this report because it was my understanding at budget that we were just um, approving it up to Castle Downs. And that was not our understanding. It was opportunity purchase for the entire line. Yeah, okay. And, 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 and I mean, this is where it gets a bit uh, challenging because this is a profile to uh, complete the preliminary engineering and land acquisition mm -hmm for the limits that were identified in the capital profile and then was approved on the basis of the land acquisition component of it. Okay, I, I could approve this if it was going to Castle Downs, but I'm not sure if I can, uh, if we're going to Campbell Road at this point. I could see it in the future, but at this point, I don't know if I could support that. That's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Prince Bay. Uh, Councillor Rice. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor Sohi. So the first question about, um, because this is extension of, from, um, uh, my English doesn't work today, uh, from uh, Blatch forward. Um, so do you have the information about uh, how many riders could be estimated and from even current extension to Bradford and from Bradford to this entire, uh, I heard uh, from the answer provided to Councillor Principal's questions. So uh, I, I just want to get that forward thinking and look at the usage and for the investment we're putting in city. Uh, so I don't have that information at hand. Um, uh, again, through the budget process, this was presented as an unfunded capital profile that identified to do design and land acquisition for the future extension. Um, today it's it's approving a bylaw for borrowing of a council's previous decision, so I don't, okay. we don't have that level of detail. Okay, and then, then the follow-up question for the Bradford neighborhood uh, is expect, expect to have like the 30,000 residents here, but so far, we only have like 45. I'm sorry, Councillor, right? that that is, that's not a relevant question to the to the borrowing bylaw. Um, that's a Blatchford, because LRD is already going to the Blatchford, that is already approved and construction is underway. Uh, I'm not finished my question yet. This is just a start point. Okay. Uh, so then, um, then my question, my question is, uh, if we're going to to do this further, borrow, 
uh, do we have the ex specific data to reflect the population around the area and the borough uh, amount? And then I would like to say that ratio and for the borrow money. So, so again, decisions that council has made previously related to LRT expansion in Edmonton included this as a priority, and I, I don't know, you know, the exact method that council determined or, or approved this, but this was identified as the next priority, and through the discussions that happened with council throughout the year leading up to budget, there was a request to bring this back as an unfunded profile. So, does that mean that? The Barlow, when we do the Barlow, I don't know anybody uh, from city administration can answer my question. And in Barlow, we are not looking at the ratio and between the Barlow amount and the population around the uh, neighborhood. So, so the way it the way it works is that as part of budget, council will identify projects that they will approve from a capital perspective, and they will identify funding source to approve oh. those projects, I know. and okay. that was done. Yeah. This is now administration carrying through yeah. with bringing the borrowing bylaw. So, th thank, thank you, Adam. I'm sorry I put you in that position, and then you don't have the information. That's all for my question. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Rutherford? Yes, thank you. Uh, so I think there's confusion, Mr. Lachlan, because I remember this very clearly from budget. There was actually no unfunded capital profile in the proposed capital budget. And I remember asking you a question because it was a simple line at the back in an appendix. And then I had to make a motion still to fund that capital profile. And yes, it did exist, but there was actually no profile that we could read in the budget. Do you remember that? Do you recall that? Uh, I I don't recall, but um, sure. I Yeah, I tried to look on the City of Edmonton website because I don't have my hard copy of the capital proposed budget, and I couldn't find the proposed budget online. I only find the approved budget, which is understandable, but I couldn't reference back to that because I, 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 but I can tell you clearly as somebody that was pushing this and remembers this, the and maybe Ms. Padbury, can, can chime in on this, but this was one in which I had been really upset because I had put a motion forward asking for an unfunded capital profile and then no unfunded capital profile was actually in the table budget, proposed budget. And the reason I bring this up is because now, even my understanding was that we were only doing land acquisition to Castle Downs because I understood, you know, for me, you know, spreading that out all the way to Campbell Road is very, you know, <laughs> we just need to get over the yellowhead and I know that's already gonna be a hurdle. I just wanted to see progress even over the yellowhead, quite frankly. So Ms. Padbury, can you, can you speak to, you, do you, in the appendix, that's where it was mentioned. I'm not sure that Ms. Padbury is with us at the no, moment. She is here. No, I'm should. here. Okay. Um, so I think this is, I'm sorry, I'm just pulling up an old, older copy of the proposed budget. Um, I think this is, yeah, one of the ones that was in, in the back identified as we didn't have a profile but we knew that it was something that you were looking to fund. Yeah, so let's see, this is where I'm saying, I think that the discrepancy now, because Mr. Lachlan is saying we approved a capital profile to Campbell Road, but I think the intention from my understanding and mind of council was to Castle Downs. And I think that's what Councillor Principe was also articulating. I would just have to go back and check the minutes because I think if it was one of the ones, so there is an approved funded profile now in the budget for $44 million for Blatchford to Campbell Road. But I think the motion made at budget was you wanted to fund it. And I think these were the profiles that we added at the very last minute, but just let me double check on that. 
Sure. Okay. Well, maybe I might come back for a second round, then give you some time to just look into that to be to be clear. Because I also have a question about um, accelerating and, and focusing on just getting over the yellowhead as well. So maybe I'll switch to that question and then come back. Um, so, Mr. Lachlan, I know uh, Mr. S Mayor, so he was very <laughs> enthusiastic, as am I. Um, but I, I, I recognize recognize that the biggest barrier with the Metro line is getting over the CN rail yard and Yellowhead. So is there a way, like, instead of, I guess, when we proceed with this project, is there a way that that section, like just dropping down in Lauderdale is the next section? And so we focus on land acquisition in that area. Do you understand what I'm saying? like as in an expedited manner? Well, that would be then getting, going down the path of expropriation. Um, mm -hmm. You know, again, the nuances of, of how this was approved at budget, uh, yeah. I, I, I don't have but, that memory. Yeah, but if, I guess for me, I guess the question is, is there any land acquisition around Lauderdale? Because we, the Lauderdale Dog Park, is that, that city land, and then there's Grand Trunk. So where it would land down anyway, it wouldn't even need land acquisition, correct? It does, but it's an internal transfer. So we would just have okay. to um, reconcile that. Um, okay, I'll come back for a second round. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And to uh, raise the specter of uh, former Alderman uh, <laughs> Gibbons and Katarina, uh, I. I'm curious, Adam, uh, about uh, the parallels here to the uh, line that uh, ends at Clearview, but uh, was initially planned to end at Gorman, and uh, the challenges—the challenge that we've had over the past many, many years—to uh, actually get that line moving forward because the decision was to stop at Clearview. Uh, by council instead of extending. Um, I, and sorry, just want to well, understand the question. I'm sorry, Constable. Okay, Get, so let me clarify the question. And that is that uh, um, when, when council was building uh, the capital line and decided to stop at Gorman, or at Clairview, the initial intent was to go all the way to Gorman and yet that never happened. And Const here we are decades later, and it still hasn't happened. And so I'm, Paquette, I'm um, just looking at that uh, particular situation in comparison to this idea of just stopping uh, at Castle Downs instead of uh, extending all the way to Campbell and the challenges that that will present in the future for actually completing uh, the remainder of that line. So, um, investment in LRT uh, is a significant investment um, when you have demands in all areas of the city, which is a good thing, um, people wanting their LR LRT in their area. It does start to um, look at segments, or it does put us in the position where we look at segments. And to answer your question, yes, sometimes it pits segment against segment. Um, two, three years ago, we provided a report to committee or council, can't remember, that identified relative priorities of these different segments with recommendations on where the next priorities would be, um, because we do know that it's a challenge to expand it all. Um, but basic answer to your question, um, it does become more challenging to finish a line off if you don't um, complete it. Um, but then again, you look at the relative priorities of benefit of, of one segment versus another and ridership of one for the other, it, it, it does sort of um, start to uh, identify relative priorities within the uh, uh, LRT network. So uh, I don't know if I uh, answered yeah, your question. No, you did. Uh, by the way, I am not advocating for government at this point. What I'm talking about uh, is that uh, the cost now to go from Clairefield to Gorman is much more than if we had just done it in the first place. And this is my concern about doing things in sections instead of just looking at the line and saying, that's what we're doing. So 
presumably, Adam, it will be it will cost more if we just stop uh, at, uh, if we just stop halfway at the halfway point and don't extend all the way. Um, that just means that it can cost down the road, but increase costs. Councillor Paquette, I would really encourage you to focus your questions on the Castle Downs line, please. That's exactly what I'm focusing on, Mr. Mayor. I'm using the Gorman as an example of how if we only stop at one point, it gets more expensive. So uh, that's, you know, this idea of stopping just at Castle Downs kind of concerns me. We've got an opportunity to not repeat the same mistakes of the past. Yeah. There's no motion to stop at Castle Downs at this time. If somebody moves that motion, then... No, I understand. Yeah. Oh, but I'm trying to clarify. It's just this idea that suddenly, oh, well... And okay. just to stop. Okay, got it. Down. Well, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Thank so you. So I'll just stop there. Okay. Uh, can you move the second round, please? Uh, happy to move okay. the second round. Second. And I'm in favor of that as well. Okay. Display the votes, please. Votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay. Uh, Councillor Prince Bay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to move a postponement of this item to the end of the agenda for further information. Yeah, we can do that. Uh, we can do that. Yeah. Because uh, that, that will give in, uh, time for the uh, financial folks to uh, come, uh, answer some of the questions. Sure. Okay. We'll move this to the back of the agenda, please. Uh, a second by Councillor Rutherford, right? Okay, got it. Okay, please vote. We're just sending that vote out in two seconds, and to yeah. clarify, that'll be the last item on council's agenda today. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Councilor Jantz? Thank you. We have all the votes. Okay, display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay. Uh, 8.7 was done. 8.8. 8.9. Okay, can someone move that we go into in camera, please? Okay. So moved. Councillor Rice. Second. Councillor Prince Bay, please vote. And just to clarify, we're going into camera subject sections 24 and 27 related to item 9.1. Okay. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. And just for councillors participating virtually, um, we're going to be sending out a new Google invitation for this item. The okay. delegation is limited to myself and the city solicitor. Um, and so if you could take a five minute recess, we can clear chambers, yes. send the meeting invitation out. Thank you.
Okay, I would like to call this meeting back to order. I will do a roll call of council members. <clears throat> uh, Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Councillor Prince Hello. Councillor Stevenson. Good afternoon. Councillor Paquette. Hello. Councillor Tang. Good afternoon. Councillor Hamilton. Good afternoon. Councillor Rutherford. Hello. Councillor Salvador. Good afternoon. Councillor Cartmill. Councillor Cartmill. Oh, there he is. Uh, <laughs> we counted you in. Uh, <laughs> uh, Councillor Rice. Here. And Councillor Jans. Good afternoon. All right. Okay, so to city clerk, let us know when we are ready uh, to move that motion. Yep. So what I'll do. Yep, so we're just going to put up, MJ's just printing something out for me here. So we're going to put up the recommendation in item 9.1, which is to approve attachment one and keep it in private. Keep it I will uh, let Con Councillor Stevenson, can you take the chair, please? I have the chair. Thank you. I will uh, move that the agreement outlined in attachment one of the April 4th, 2023, Office of the City Clerk reports OCC 01822 be approved. That the April 4th, 2023, Office of the City Clerk report OCC 01822 remain private pursuant to section 24, revised from officials and 27 privileged information of the Freedom of Information and uh, Protection of Privacy Act. Do I have a second here? Second. Thank you, I think that was Councillor Knack. Uh, did anybody wish to speak to this? I see Councillor Knack on the board, please go ahead. Sorry, I have just a, a public question on oh, this, uh, just to the clerk. Uh, just, I know there was conversation about a uh, uh, next step conversation. Um, I don't know if we settled on when we would have that, but I'm thinking it might be beneficial to get a bit of time so you can gather that all together. So I yeah. just want to confirm. I appreciate that. So my understanding is I'll come back with a verbal update at the next council meeting, what the next steps would be. Okay, great. So there will be a chance to chat about it at that time. Thank you. Those are all my questions. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Anyone else with questions or wishing to speak to the motion? I'm not seeing any, so I will call the vote. Councillor Rice? We have all the votes. Thank you. Please display the vote. <laughs> and that's carried. I'll return the chair. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Uh, so, Clerk, are we going back to 8.6 or are we going to uh, go to the motion spending? Um, it's really your choice, but technically it's still an item to be dealt with on your agenda. So I'd suggest if you could deal with the bylaw now, and then we could just jump into motions pending, followed by notices of motion. Okay, we'll do that, and we have the right people here. Great. All right, so we were... There was a speaking order to that. Okay. Uh, Councillor Rutherford. I think Councillor Principe, you, oh, you, you actually moved. Yeah, Councillor Rutherford, yeah. Uh, I'm just going to pass it over to Mr. Lachlan, who I think has some clarity okay. to provide the public as well as, as council on yeah. this item. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Rutherford. And, and my mistake, um, the profile was approved at budget. However, uh, part of the motion of approval identified land, ac <coughs> excuse me, land acquisition to Castle Downs. So... I, I remembered the approved the profile, but I didn't remember the nuance within the capital amendment, which included land acquisition to Castle Downs. So the 20 million that's allocated based on this borrowing bylaw is for the profile, but the funds are allocated for opportunity land acquisition to Castle Downs, not to Campbell Road, as I commented earlier. So I just wanted to provide that clarification. And that's based on the capital amendment that was put forward during budget deliberations. 
Yeah, so with that clarity, I'm happy to move that bylaw 20441 be read a first time. Second. Uh, okay. 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 You sure, Councilor? Okay. I think that was seconded by Councilor Principe. Okay. All right. Uh, moved by Councilor Rutherford, second by Councilor Principe. Uh, anyone to speak? Uh, I'd like to, but I'm yeah. having trouble clicking on. No, I, okay, please do click on. And uh, Councillor Stevenson, can you take the chair, please? I have the chair. Yeah. No, I really appreciate that clarity and uh, uh, from administration. Uh, I am really excited about this work, uh, this project moving forward uh, as quickly as possible. And uh, so look forward to the progress on this. And this approval of this borrowing bylaw will allow administration to... Uh, uh, engage with the uh, opportunities to uh, purchase properties uh, uh, to uh, move this pro project forward. Also want to, you know, uh, look forward to the opening of the uh, the Blatchford uh, line and because uh, that is important component of getting there then moving forward into into Castle Downs. Uh, Castle Downs and Northwest has been waiting for LRT expansion for decades and I'm glad that this council uh, made it a priority because uh, that neighborhood, uh, that uh, people living in those neighborhoods deserve to have access to uh, uh, a rapid transit system that uh, that we have been able to build to the rest of uh, rest uh, other four qu three quadrants of the uh, of the city. So look forward to the work uh, commencing. Yeah, and I will take the chair back, and I will go to Councillor Paquette to speak. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I am very pleased to uh, give this motion my full support. Um, I was at budget as well. There is a part of me that actually wants to make an amendment to take it a little further uh, to Campbell Road, knowing the experience that we've had with other LRT lines, but I will not. Uh, so instead, I will uh, just urge Council to fully support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mayor Solhi. So I, I would like to start what I heard from Edmontonians. Uh, Edmontonians told me over and over, so they do not want our city to take on more debt at this moment. And they don't like to see empty LRT cars. Without some information I asked earlier about the ratio uh, between the investment amount and the population around the neighborhoods and the community. I think it's very difficult to make the decision. Um, specifically, the decision for infrastructure 100% growth. Uh, I recall, and when we back to the budget uh, deliberation discussion debate, We are really trying to find the balance between the infrastructure growth and the infrastructure renewal. And then the data presented by state administration indicated very clear, we are not doing enough investment in the renewal. And instead of we put lots of investment uh, in the growth. Um, I agree with Mayor Sohi's point, yes, and then everybody in the neighborhood deserves the equal access and cross the entire city to our public transit. However, based on the situation right now we're facing, I didn't see the emergency at this moment, we have to do some additional or new investment and without have very strong evidence to demonstrate that needs. I encourage my colleagues really concerned about our city's debt amount we have right now. How that did that and impact 
our current economic situation, and our future economic situation, and specifically impact our next generation. And I heard over and over from some of Edmontonians asking me, do you know how much debt after 2023-26 budgets approved? Do you know exactly the number? I know they just ask a counselor and then use this question, question to remind us and how we can look at our spending, our new investment carefully. Um, I, I know it's a difficult decision and for me to make because I do wish to see our city and has sufficient or more public transit to meet the needs. Just without that data to demonstrate these needs right now from our city is the emergency we have to do right now. And I don't have that evidence right now. But I do think it's important there will be future opportunities to revisit some investment at this moment. Therefore, I will be voted against this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Reyes. Uh, Councillor Nack. Uh, thanks, Mayor Sohi. You know, and, I, and, and I, while I appreciate the, the caution that was just raised, uh, I, I feel like I wanted to offer a few comments. Um, I, I think about the creation of the debt management fiscal policy in the 90s um, by the councils of the day and how that debt policy and the policy that we've recently revised continues to be one of the most um, conservative debt policies of any municipality across this province. In fact, far more conservative than what, than what the provincial government actually allows for in the Municipal Government Act. So, uh, you know, yes, we're coming up on sort of the maximum of our debt limit because we have made investments and it started back in 2004. There have been some substantial investments in infrastructure by councils for the last 20 years because there was an infrastructure deficit. We did not build rec centers, we did not build libraries, we did not build fire halls, we did not, we did not even maintain our infrastructure in our city because there was, so, there was so lack of a willingness to take on any debt that they just sacrificed the future of our city for the sake of having a bunch of 0% tax increases. And, and so I have great confidence in the debt management fiscal policy that was created and recently updated and I'm and, and very comfortable operating within that policy to make sure that we continue to address things that, um, that are, are sorely needed. LRT, mass transit out to this part of the city is sorely needed, has been needed for, I mean, as, about as long as LRT coming out to the West End. <laughs> and we're finally building that project. But it took this type of investment first in acquiring land. But I mean, really from the, from the initial approval of the route for the Valley Line West LRT to when we finally approved the construction, that was like a 15 to 20 year exercise. And this is just the first step that allows us to start acquiring land. So, so I guess my feeling is that if we assume that we are going to build this line, whether it be today, five years from now, or 10 years from now, we need the land and we need to be able to start doing some of that work so that when provincial and federal money come into place, we're ready to go and we're not left reacting uh, and having to respond because frankly, the provincial and federal money will never come if we haven't done this step of the work. So we have to start it somewhere. And that doesn't, this, that doesn't mean we have to go and spend the construction of this, we, you know, if suddenly the province and feds came two years from now and said, we wanna build it now. It doesn't mean we have to then build it. We might not have the debt capacity to build it in two years if that happened to come forward but we need to have this work done. And, and I, again, just for that part of the city in particular, I mean, you know, I, like all of us, I'm sure, in, in each of our wards, <laughs> you will always hear from residents who feel like they are constantly the, the group being left out. 
I still hear it in the West End that they feel like they're being left out, even though we're finally building an LRT, we're building rec centers, we're, we're investing in infrastructure. But I'll still have people to this day say, oh, we're, we're, we're not getting our fair share compared to the rest of the city. I think based off actual investment, I, we can safely argue that's not the case. But honestly, for, for this part of the city, I think it's a really fair comment. I, I would not dispute that, even though there are good investments in things like neighborhood renewal and alley renewal and other infrastructure renewal. And so in terms of some of those new investments, I don't think we're, we've been doing our part. And so that's why I think we, and we need to give that sign to this part of the city that, that it is important work. And, and it, might, it will take time, like the Valley Line West, it will take time like other projects that we've got to do. But we've got to get that process started and having watched the, and again, I watched the Valley Line West process, not in this chair, I started it watching, <laughs> at the time, Councillor Sohi going through those conversations and gosh, from the moment you started talking about it to when I finally in 2019, or whatever year it was, finally got to stand at the time of construction, like there I was at 23 years old thinking, uh, when I first got involved in 2007, thinking like, oh great, we're, you know, if we work hard, we'll get this done and by the time I'm, you know, 10 years from now, I'll have LRT out to the West End. I'm 39 now. <sighs> Slowly waiting, <laughs> but it'll probably take 20 years by the time that conversation started with you as a councillor mayor. So, so um, I just I wanted to jump in because I, I I know that debt's important and I know it's but we have a we are very good at managing our money as a city. The province literally just adopted a fiscal management that applies the exact same rules that we've been applying in the city of Edmonton for year after year after year, which is not running deficits, keeping spending to population plus inflation growth. And so I think there, I am actually really comfortable with where we're at and very supportive of this. So just thought I'd offer that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nack. Councillor Rutherford to close. Yes, thank you, Mayor Sohi. I wasn't expecting to talk to this item today. I wasn't going to select it, but it got selected. And, and so it gives me another soapbox opportunity to jump on. I want to start by reminding everyone on council that this was approved unanimously, unanimously at budget. That was the time to have the debate about population ratios and is this a value or not. This is a procedural piece of that puzzle. So I just want to put that out there first and foremost. Um, I also really appreciate Councillor Piquette's eagerness to go all the way to Campbell Road. And I would absolutely love that to happen. But I also want to see action. Northwest residents want to see action. And the truth of the matter is, I don't know that there would be even a line to Clareview if we hadn't sectioned it off. And I really worry that, that we need to section it. We need to get over the yellowhead. We need to get over sea on rail. That is a huge barrier. It's huge, huge barrier to that. And so for me, I just can't see us approving that whole thing in its totality. Um, but I appreciate the sentiments. And if I had a magic wand, I would absolutely make that happen. Um, you know, and I just want to take a minute to talk about quickly, um, you know, again, as counselors, our job is to absolutely make data informed decisions and to also listen to the public. It's both and it's not either or. And we can't cherry pick when data is convenient and when listening to the public is convenient. So again, I just remind you, we've already had this debate. I have the same enthusiasm as Mayor Sohi want to see this move forward. The residents that I represent have been eager to see solution. They know it's small. They know it doesn't mean an LRT is coming in the next four years or more, but they're glad to see movement. And so I appreciate and again remind everybody that the unanimous support that you gave that budget really said a lot to the residents of the ward that I represent. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Please vote. Give us two seconds and MJ's going to send that out. Here it is. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. It is carried. Okay. 
All right. That was the last of the bylaws. Now motion spending. 10.1 Office Tower Conversions. Councillor Nack. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Um, so I will read this out, and I have just one uh, small addition in the example. I forgot to include NAOP in that list, so I will read this out. And I should note that uh, Councillor Stevenson is likely to second this as we worked on this uh, as a group here. So the, I'll move that administration work with external stakeholders, example, UDI, BOMA, CHBA, ER, DBA, DRC, NAOP, and the Edmonton Chamber of Commerce, et cetera and engage the province to request financial incentives, including but not limited to provincial legislation and regulation amendments for increasing the uh, number of new residential and office tower conversion to residential in Edmonton's downtown. Second. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So, so this is uh, a little more open-ended than I would have uh, actually created when I first was drafting the motion. Um, the motion I would, had originally drafted was going to be very prescriptive in asking the province to look at amending the uh, Bill Seven, which Bill Seven uh, was introduced as a way to allow uh, essentially not start collecting property taxes on industrial development to incent that development. It was essentially a, a zero-cost way that municipalities could bring in additional development. I still think that's ultimately the goal I, I'm interested in, but the, uh, in chatting with administration, it was suggested it would be good to leave this a little bit more open-ended, just so when we're engaging with the province, we don't, we don't uh, simply prescribe a set solution. Um, so part of why I wanted to bring this forward and in, in, in working with Councillor Stevenson, uh, noting that uh, just last week, I think it was, or a week and a half ago at executive committee, there was some conversation around the CRL and there was a separate motion that was put forward by Mayor Sohi, I think in collaboration with uh, Councillor Stevenson and Councillor Wright, I believe, had input into that motion. Uh, but that focuses on use of the CRL for ways to help do this. This is uh, broader than the CRL and, and in fact, if, uh, if something like an incentive program were introduced, the way the rules are currently set up provincially, you couldn't introduce something like this in a location where you have a CRL. So that would require a change from the province. Um, but probably the big question is why even do this? Uh, I think not unlike a lot of the conversation that occurred last week, uh, one of the big things we're dealing with right now is that I think Edmonton, as per the last quarter report, now has one of the, if not the highest office tower vacancy rate in Canada, uh, over 23%, which is uh, now getting to a point where, where that is actually quite concerning. And we also need people living downtown. We need way more people living downtown if we're gonna address things like community safety and well-being, vibrancy. And I know I only have two minutes for the intro, so I see some folks on the, uh, on the board for questions and I'll, I'll offer more at the closing. Okay, thank you, Councillor Nack. Councillor Cartmel. Thank you. Um, so appreciating the sentiment of the motion, I wonder if there was language considered that would see how long these incentives would remain in place. So if, if we're talking about tax relief, if we're talking about tax deferral, um, that kind of a thing, like a, a timeline for how long those things would be in place for, for whoever would receive that benefit. Yes, that, that's going to be part of I, I've had some preliminary conversations with a number of the folks listed in the motion. They have some ideas. But again, I, I didn't want to get too prescriptive in the motion and start saying it should be X number of years. But yes, I, you would ha ultimately have to have something like that. Or a minimum number of years. I don't know if you want oh, to. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, and, and in the case of an office tower conversion, some of the feedback I've received is we might need to look at, you know, a 10-year type approach at least because that's what other cities are, are doing. Five years might even not be enough to do something like that. Well, that was my next thought is that uh, do we maybe – First of all, in your conversations, do we have a sense of just how many buildings would be convertible? I've had some conversations, and, and some office tower conversions are much harder than others, but I've heard of at least uh, probably three to four that uh, would be easier to do. I've heard that there is interest uh, from some folks who work in this area who have engaged some of these office tower owners, that there's, there's probably three or four that could fit in this right away. Uh, but... I think there's quite a bit more out there, but again, I just don't know how easy some of those other ones are because some can be quite quite challenging. So
so I think I think there would be and maybe that maybe that's part of the work of this motion but I think there would have to be some conversation about that and then what the program looks like you know so my my sense of it is that those are really hard to do um, you know and just just one example apartment buildings tend to have all the washrooms stacked so all the plumbing goes up in in several stacks in a building office towers don't so you know to make that conversion if there if there's three buildings that we can do that's one thing that that doesn't really support blanket support or blanket uh, things like CRLs which are kind of you know uh, blanket approaches whereas if there's 15 or 20 buildings then maybe a, a blanket approach might be part of that thoughts yeah and again I think that's part of why bringing all these groups together I, I I've I've chatted with these folks in a room, <laughs> and and most of these organizations have been in the same room at the same time. But and and generally speaking, there is a widespread support. But they also wanted to be part of drafting what that would look like yeah. and, and helping to shape that and work. And they wanted to help us advocate to the province on this. Uh, so help shape the request, is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so then, I, last question. Then timing for a, um, are we asking for a report? We're just directing administration to work with external stakeholders. I'm just wondering what a timeline for that work, uh, Councillor Knack, because I don't know how many people are on the cusp of repurposing their buildings or, or in signing tenants or in doing, you know, taking some action. Uh, if this is going to kind of hang out there for a, a year, not to be, I'm not trying to be provocative, but you know, if it's going to hang out there for a while, we might actually delay some work that might otherwise happen versus something that, you know, happens between now and summer. I was actually hoping, and I, I just saw the due date, and I, I was at, knowing that there's some work, uh, I was hoping this could come back in September, um, in part for that. It, it gives a bit of time to recognize that we're going to have a provincial election and new, minister, new or old returning ministers need to get into their position. But I also didn't want to wait too much longer for that very reason, is that there are other cities that are doing um, different types of incentives right now. And the longer we wait to, to get that, the, the more you potentially hold up that from occurring. So I, I would actually prefer changing the date, knowing it could be a little tough, to, to September. Well, I'll leave that with you. But I, and because yeah. of particularly if there's a question around education, uh, the education portion of property tax, that's going to take somebody getting in and, and yeah. understanding their new portfolio. But if we, we could have the effect of actually delaying work instead of incenting it, and we're in competition with every other city in, in Western North America to actually have capital invested here. So I'm a little worried about the delay function, but appreciate the sentiment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cartmill. Councillor Jans. Yeah, thank you for this. Um, I guess, so a couple exploratory questions. One, so uh, there is a surplus of commercial space on the market right now. All, that sounds like a problem for landlords. I have heard that uh, some tenants, however, have been getting great rents downtown. And I know some nonprofits who are saying it's phenomenal right now that Edmonton's competitive advantage is actually cheap space downtown. Um, how, would you, how would you respond to some of those sort of uh, thoughts? I'll try to be quick on this answer. Um, our vacancy rate at the level it is now, over 20%, starts to get into a very different state than it was, say, even five or six years ago. So uh, we used to have, you know, double digits in the teens vacancy rates. So did the city of Calgary. But Calgary's vacancy rates were primarily in their A-class buildings, not in the B and C class like we have, which with a certain amount of vacancy in B and C class, you can produce that type of economic benefit to nonprofits, other startups that maybe can find cheap space. When you start reaching this level, there is a risk, like they saw in Calgary about three or four years ago, because their vacancy rate was so high, uh, which is around the number we're facing right now, their assessment value in their downtown essentially crumbled. And it meant that small businesses outside of the d downtown core saw double-digit property tax increases for multiple years in a row. Um, so yes, there can be a healthy vacancy rate. I don't think over 20% is anything close to what you would consider healthy. And so, so that's the issue. If it were 15 or 12 or something like that, you could probably get away with that. But that's not what we're facing right now. So that doesn't seem to be the response we, get, we got from an assessment and taxation a few weeks ago where uh, there's a memo and by email we got that essentially was, you know, if there's a, a tenant downtown and that tenant moves to South Common, the assessed value is essentially moving pieces around on the board 
that if it's so long as they remain in Edmonton and remain in business, mm -hmm. it's a house here is a house there, a business there is a business here. Like obviously there's economies of scale with certain fe features, but I guess um, for me it, it comes down to like I, I, I want more people living downtown. I want to fulfill the city plan goals. Just is it better to do a, a kind of a doorway bonusing like we did with Railtown that got thousands of people onto 109th Street? It's like residential yeah. conversions as best as I can tell from talking to industry seem really – a dice roll. So I'm, I'm wondering so, why you narrowed in on that tool. So I love the idea of a per door like they did in the 90s, but I think the mayor's motion at exec using the CRL is a way to do that. But quite frankly, we don't have enough money outside of the CRL to do anything else. So we could use the CRL for a per door. And I, I actually think it's a both and, not an either or. I think we need to do a per door. And I think we need to see if the province will change the rules because that's that's the scope of the issue we're dealing with. But like right the now. opportunity cost of a residential conversion is so significant, and for the reasons Councilor Cartmel and others have highlighted, I've I've been reaching out to developers and and architects in other cities where they've been trying to do this, and they've said like, I said, should we support this or not? And they said it's it depends on the project. We can't say. So I'm wary of essentially providing a cash subsidy to somebody who doesn't necessarily need it at the opportunity cost of say you know, another rail town. Well, and again, the, the what I would be looking at is not something that we have to use out of our operating budget, like the construction grant from a few years ago. I'm looking to use the existing tax tools that don't actually have a, a, a operating cash requirement from the city of Edmonton, so. But that's effectively putting it on our credit card rather than paying cash out our wallet. Like no, we'll it just it means you're sometime. not collecting, I mean, essentially what it is is that you're not collecting taxes as early as you would uh, if if the property, so if the project was going to go forward, you're essentially not collecting the full property taxes until f whatever number of years after you decide to allow them to complete the conversion and lease up that space. Whereas if they start that work uh, right now with an empty office tower, yeah. you're paying essentially still that full property tax amount. I guess I'm, I'm excited for the stakeholders to do their own advocacy. Yeah. I'm reticent to leverage our table on anything but housing, housing, housing right now yeah. on, on our key messages um, until we get a little more clarity. I'm wondering if the mover would consider either like um, getting us some more detail or something here before like I or like I, I just don't want to go out and be advocating this as a as a, a panacea if we. Yeah, I'm, I'm just I'm really I know we can only take, you know, a one pager into the premier. What's going on that one pager? Yeah. I'm just I need to be more convinced here on the mm -hmm. fine print. I think you're out of time, so I probably can't. Sorry. Answer. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> Respecting the time. No, I'm happy to answer that. But. OK. All right. No, I'm happy to answer if somebody wants to ask. We have with us joining. Uh, Kids or stu uh, sorry, students, students from uh, Aurora Charter School with their teacher, Ms. C. Wishard. And Aurora School is in Ward Nernick. And uh, the ward representative for that area is Councillor Rutherford, and she's joining us virtually in the meeting. Welcome to City Hall. Nice to see you all. Are you here for the afternoon only, or you're? Okay. Well, enjoy the trip. Okay. And have fun. Okay. <laughs> Lovely to see you all. Okay. All right, Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, stick around as long as you like. Uh, but just wanted to, I guess, ask the mover um, how this this motion or this this potential direction might interact with some of the work that's happening through the Edmonton Metropolitan Region Economic Recovery Working Group, because I know there was a report that was released just yesterday, um, and there are various stakeholders, BOMA, Edmonton Global, um, some educational institutions, the DBA, 
CBRE industry members who are part of that. And it looks like um, a number of the recommendations are around downtown vibrancy, recovery, um, particularly around how do we bring more people downtown to the core. Uh, how do you see this interacting with that work, recognizing that there's a lot of crossover with those stakeholders and particularly from, um, yeah, that advocacy perspective and recognizing there's a lot of expert feedback around that table. Would this motion uh, be complementary to that or? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just, That's the short, short answer, answer. yes. Yeah. Would you like to expand on that sure. a little? <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, again, I, I, I'm not looking to start a new body of work. Um, this is very much meant to, to uh, take on what, what has already been talked about with a number of these organizations. That's part of why I went to engage these organizations in advance to see if they felt that this, this would be additive to the work that they've already been talking about and the work that they've already been doing. And the feedback I would suggest has been quite positive that this would be seen as an additive way to help address what is a broader set of issues that we're dealing with right now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Salvador, Councillor Prince. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So the purpose of this, is it to create more vibrancy downtown, more residents yes. to create vibrancy downtown? Yeah, essentially okay. the, the concern I have right now, and, and I don't want to speak for the ward councillor in the downtown area, um, you know, uh, but I talked about this briefly, is that in, in the downtown, if we're on an Oilers game night, things are pretty busy. Uh, on a non-Oilers game night, we're still not where we need to be. And you can't put on an event every single night in the downtown. One of the best ways to help bring that is if we have the people living downtown that are walking to the grocery stores that are going to the art gallery or Windsphere because they live downtown and those are the hubs for them, that is a way to help increase safety and vibrancy in a lot of ways. Okay, great. And the Oilers are in the playoffs. So, so we'll great. have a little bit more, which is great. <laughs> uh, and have we seen other cities do this? What, and how, how has that gone for them? So many cities, including Calgary right now, are actually doing a per-door grant. Um, and they're do not just doing the per-door grant, they're looking at other economic incentives. Um, the, the concept specifically related to Bill 7 uh, would be fairly unique to Alberta, which is part of why I'm interested in it, uh, because that tool doesn't necessarily exist everywhere. Again, I, I didn't want to prescribe that tool exclusively in the motion based off feedback from Amin, but that could be a unique tool because um, unlike the construction grant that we used a few years ago for new residential towers, which required us setting aside money in our operating budget to do that, um, this ideally doesn't have a, an upfront cost. You're just not collecting your taxes at a, uh, right away. Is there a potential to uh, make too many residential space and not have enough office space? I, I don't think at this point, with the, with the vacancy rate that we're dealing with, I don't think so. Um, and, and again, I think that can be part of the conversation with all of these stakeholders too, is that you know, how, how many do you uh, authorize? A little bit to Councillor Carmel's point is, that do, you know, do we have an issue with 10 or 15 buildings and do you reach a point where you say then this, this uh, phases out, if that were to proceed? And part of it, especially if we went the Bill 7 route, would require changes from the province in the first place. So number one, we need to see if they'd be on board and then going through that next page. Okay, and would you like to answer uh, Michael Jans's <laughs> sure. question, please? Yeah, I mean, essentially, I, I think the question that Councillor Jans asked um, related to how much advocacy we can do, are we spreading ourselves too thin? I, I think that's what I sort of took away from that question. Um, we've been, as a city, as a city council, talking quite a bit about downtown vibrancy, so I see this very much in line with the existing advocacy we've already been doing. This is just looking to use another tool uh, within that same conversation that we're already having around downtown vibrancy and, and safety and security. And so uh, it's not, uh, for me, I don't view this as something that is um, separate from what we've already asked for in terms of support from the provincial government. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, that's it for me. Thank you, Councillor Principe, Councillor Wright. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Nack. You're preparing him well. Oh, you're all preparing him well. <laughs> I'm just wondering, um, I understand the, the need um, to, you know, create that vibrancy in the downtown area, and I'm just wondering, could it also be used to spread it around Edmonton a little bit to increase housing supply across the city? Yeah, I don't, you know, obviously the focus right now a little more on downtown, but, I mean, if there was an openness from the province of expanding how Bill 7 could be used, it doesn't have to be specific to downtown. We could look at it in 
any variety right. of areas. But you know, I, I, I didn't want to get too carried away on the beginning of this motion. The, the meant was that there was meant to be a bit more of a focus on the court, but nothing's yes. stopping us from having that conversation. So if the administration wanted to provide us some further information for the rest of the city, they, they could? Yeah, and again, I think leaving it uh, fairly open-ended, again, okay. uh, gives that opportunity to, to not be uh, saying we have to do it in this exact way. Okay, okay. thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Hamilton. Hi, um, thank you, uh, Councillor Knack. Uh, I've been listening to this conversation um, and I feel like, uh, so everybody I think has provided very good feedback. I take Councillor Jans's point very well. I think that we might have a bit of a, a structure issue and I hate doing this, but I think some wordsmithing um, I know everyone loves wordsmithing at council, but what I've established from the conversation is that the goal of your motion specifically, and I take Councillor Wright's point that we need to um, talk about increasing housing across the city. There's a, 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 a collective, I think, concern for the court. I think that's valid, but I think that there's learnings from that. Um, so I, I'm not gonna discount that, but, um, but what I take from your motion is that your goal uh, is to increase residents downtown. Um, and I, I'm inclined to agree with that. I think what I read in your motion is that you're somewhat agnostic if it's new doors or if it's conversions, but you want that, that option. And I take Councillor Jans's point very well that, um, you're, uh, that, that it might not be financially feasible. Um, I think that's actually a very good point. Um, and uh, I also, uh, the, so I think the issue is in the middle there, we have a bunch of caveats to this. Um, and that may be uh, that we move forward with advocacy um, and uh, that could include both legislative in or legislative changes and financial incentives. And um, this is about new residential, but it could include rehab of those B and C class buildings as well uh, that are already residential um, uh, as well as office tower conversion. So I might propose that um, we kind of streamline that that to uh, that administration work with external stakeholders, example listed, uh, to discuss recommendations for increasing the uh, um, increase. Uh, now my staff are going to laugh at me. I can't read my own handwriting. Increasing the the number of new residential units in downtown Edmonton, uh, which may include like like bracket um, refurbished or converted residential. Um, and any, uh, and sort of come back perhaps with what either legislative changes or fiscal financial incentives. Because what I read from this is that you're looking at, a, you're kind of looking for a plan and for the quote unquote team Edmonton to get on board with what that plan is, is do we think the best way forward or the best bang for our buck is financial incentives? Do we think it's uh, legislative change? Um, so that might be my recommendation that we maybe like restate the motion for clarity because I'm not hearing inherent disagreement around the table uh, in terms of the direction, but I think some of the concerns about being really specific about office conversion, about advocacy are, are valid concerns. So I might suggest that you restate the motion and, and sort of clarify that. Would you be amenable to it? Yes. Okay. So, so are you, are you uh, Councillor Hamilton, are you suggesting some uh, language for a clerk to... Uh, I am, but um, I know how much everyone loves to wordsmith on the fly, <laughs> so I might suggest uh, that we, um, maybe it's 216, maybe um, Councillor Nack and I, we can go back and forth on that. I would might suggest that we postpone this. Um, I know there's other people with questions, uh, but that we might uh, uh, postpone this and get to 10.2 so we can sort of work on some of that language and see no. if it clarifies the intention of the motion but a bit better. Like why don't you kind of work as we go through the questions from other council members? Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. we'll do that. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Paquette, because Councillor Paquette has other suggestions that you may want to include in the, uh, in, the uh, amend, uh, in, in the motion, yeah. Yeah, maybe some food for thought. Um, did you give any thought to maybe uh, adding uh, conversations with the federal government and the CMHC? I hadn't, uh, and part of why I didn't is again, I, I, what I don't want to fall too far down is creating this huge body of work that to Councillor Cartmel's point ends up taking a year or a year and a half thereby holding up everything. 
my original intent was exclusively to actually ask about Bill 7, but it was administration's recommendation to leave that a little more open-ended. But I worry the more we add to it, the more they're gonna say that deadline is, is not feasible and then we're gonna miss out on a lot. So I'm open to having that conversation just as long as we can keep it prescribed in the timeline. Yeah, I, I, I would just be curious about your thoughts about keeping that like sort of uh, on the table simply because the response might be, yeah, we'd love to help you out, now go to the feds. Yeah, and so if, if it's more of a simple question, it's not, and not just, I just don't want to get in into something that's going to add months of timeline, but yeah, that, that's yeah. fine with me. Well, it's six of one, half a dozen the other on yeah. that one, I think, because that's what we've heard so many times, is that, uh, well, we can't just do it in isolation. We need uh, three, uh, all three orders of government involved. And if we don't have that in the mix at the beginning, then we've got to go back. And that's another uh, potential time waster, and so... I guess it depends on which one you think is going to be the most uh, efficient use of time. Yeah, I, I mean, realistically, I think legislation changes are going to be the most supported by the provincial government. I think we've heard the Premier a little less enthusiastic about grants, um, in particular in relation to Calgary. They've been talking about it. So, I, so again, happy to have that conversation about the financial piece and even the feds, but I actually expect more of our time will be on legislative changes. Yeah, so as you work on the structure, maybe that's a point one for the main and then point two for the federal government conversation. And that way they can be worked uh, simultaneously but separate. Yeah? Yes. Okay, and then the last question is, um, we're, we're talking about office buildings, but, um, and I don't, I'm not sure if we have a, a glut of hotel spaces, but are hotels in the mix here in your thinking? I'm, I'm, I'm not opposed to it. That's not an issue I've heard as much. Yeah, um, yeah. I but I think the issue would be that can we convert office towers to hotels, right? Because that's... Oh, uh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Cause, uh, because there's already a one very successful yeah. uh, conversion underway yeah. in, in downtown. No, right? Not yeah. at all opposed to that yeah. idea. Yeah. That seems interesting. Sure, if, there, if there's an openness and desire. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and then uh, last, I, I see that you, you want to go like right to the request instead of explore, is, and that has to do with like legislation concerns and time-based concerns. Legislation concerns, timeline concerns, existing state of affairs in our downtown core, frankly, um, and the vacancy rate in the core. So I don't, I don't want to, this is one I'm not looking to take a long time on. Okay. And uh, I, I know in the past uh, you wanted to explore the uh, challenges of infill. So I'm just wondering if you're going to be exploring the challenges of conversion as well. Just kidding. You don't have to answer that one. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, um, I have a question to administration first. Um, maybe from somebody from planning. Yes, we do have some representatives here that can help. Do we currently as a city, and I know this was kind of discussed last at a committee meeting, do we currently have a policy that requires first floors of residential to be commercial as a city? Councillor Rutherford, I think I'm going to ask uh, Branch Manager Liberté to weigh in on that. I'm not particularly certain on it. Are they online? Yes, she's in the meeting. I'm there. She's, she's just she's there. Okay. I think we can yeah. hear her. Okay. Yeah. I'm here, sorry about that. I just had uh, some technical uh, difficulties. So um, this is something that um, in that I, I'd need to turn to Kim Petron to answer more specifically on um, particular zoning um, in our downtown core. But generally speaking, that yes, uh, we, uh, from a planning perspective, try to look for buildings that have um, that commercial, commercial property on the main floor, simply because it gives that element of activity, vibrancy, um, not only that our communities in our downtown core that are looking for, but we use to activate our main streets. Uh, the more specifics of um, uh, the details of um, zoning requirements, I'd need to, to turn that over to Kim Petron if she's on the line. And, and just to be brief, because I do have a follow-up question, so I just want to make sure. 
I don't maybe think, while we're waiting yeah. for while we're waiting for Kim, I'll just turn to the mover. Because this is a thing that I'm, I'm I'm having trouble squaring because we're going to lobby to the province to change a policy when we have a policy that innately requires more commercial space within the downtown. So to me, those things seem at odds with each other. Can you speak to that, to the mover? Yeah, I think a bit. I, I mean, I think the first piece is that we do want quite a bit more commercial downtown, but we need a we need a population to support it, not unlike our mature neighborhoods that have seen a hollowing out. And so I'd like to see if we can fix that piece. And, and again, I think um, based off the current vacancy rates that we're looking at right now, um, those aren't just going to be changed overnight. And, and so I think when there's a debate between vibrancy, I'd rather have something starting to move in one direction versus potentially leaving those spaces vacant for a really long time, which, which I think will do more harm than good. Yeah, but I also think like, so I guess what I'm struggling with is why wouldn't we use our own tools first before jumping to advocacy? Because what I heard from that speaker that came to committee, and it was very powerful to me, was that we have a bunch of vacant, like it doesn't, it's not creating vibrancy in downtown. We have a bunch of vacant commercial spaces because of a policy that we as a city have. And in addition to that, it makes it very cost prohibitive for many developers to actually build residential unless they're going to build a high, a high, you know, a high rise that's what i'm looking for so i guess i'm just i'm really struggling with how how come as a first next best step that wouldn't be our first next best step i i it's sort of similar to the question around a per door credit i i think it's a it's a both and in all of these cases and, and bill seven is technically a, a tool for municipalities but it was created by the province and so I view that as is asking for their permission to expand how mm -hmm. that tool is currently being used while at the same time looking at those zoning changes while at the same time looking at the per door credits. I think you need but all we of haven't had, We didn't have a motion come out of committee, nor did we have a motion today to explore that policy. Uh, not, not the one that was raised at that committee meeting. I think the motion that the mayor made dealt more with the financial use of the CRL. You're right. I, so I don't know if there's been a separate motion yeah. from that. And there probably should be, but but yeah, just for me, I was focused on this particular one. Okay, I'm not going to ask another question because I'm out of time, so I will yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Rice. I'm I'm give I'm give you uh, more time to break. <laughs> so yeah, I'm going to ask a question to administration first, and I'll come back to you. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can take time to drink water. <laughs> so from our city current situation, do we have uh, the data to demonstrate the ratio and between the office buildings and then residential buildings and specifically in downtown? Councillor Rice, once again, I'm gonna ask uh, if Alyssa has that information that we can, we can share. Um, I don't have the ratio specifically between residential and uh, office buildings, but um, I can say the the percentage of vacancy that Councillor Knack has been talking about is 23% vacancy. That That's uh, what we're seeing on our end as well. Um, so that's a number I'll have to follow up on. Uh, okay, so if you could follow up, that would be really helpful. Uh, for me to ask this question, because I heard for the financial request from our city or from funding source CRA. So, however, and if we convert the office tower to the residential buildings, uh, so from a financial perspective, there are, two, there are at least two factors needs to, com to be considered. The first one is the cost and from infrastructure perspective. And second, how does this impact the CRA? And because if we, when we say we use the CRA to, to support this type of conversion and without looking at the change from CRA, and I don't think that is reasonable. And if, if the change 
I try to understand. Maybe somebody can help me understand better how this impact CR change. Is CR reduce or CR increase? Infuse reduce, and that means we cannot find this resor funding resources actually to support、uh, this infrastructure and conversion project. So I'm I I just want to think in that way. So is there anybody can help me understand from that financial CR? L perspective. So, Councillor Rice, if that's to administration. Yes. Okay.、Um, I believe <laughs>、uh, a CRL was、yeah. what you were referring to.、Um, <clears throat> so I'm not. I don't believe that assessment has been done of what any changes would do to、um, the CRL. We do have、um, Alyssa as well online that may be able to、um, illuminate, and we do have、uh, Branch Manager Kate Watt on the assessment side that perhaps could comment as well. Yeah, thanks, Kent. I think、um, Councillor Rice, I,、uh, Kent is a hundred percent. We haven't done that specific analysis,、um, and we can speak theoretically of what we we think that impact could be on the CRL、uh, around. Um, tax uplift and such, but I'll、um, turn that over to Kate to answer more specifically on on any any of the taxation pieces.、Uh, thank you very much, Alyssa.、Um, it it is as my colleagues are saying,、uh, something that would require an actual analysis. The thing that we would be looking at if this was able to be enabled within the CRL, which we understand it isn't currently under the way the legislation has been written, we would be looking at. The, the difference in assessed value and the difference in taxable、um, taxable value in the tax uplift, and in my head when I'm when I'm sort of looking at this, I'm I would be concerned that the the change in the tax rate might mean, as you're saying, Councillor Rice, that there is、uh, less uplift <laughs> than there would be、mm -hmm. if it had remained、uh, non-residential. That said. A building that is entirely vacant has a has a, a very low value, so it really would depend on the case by case analysis, and we would be looking at that、uh, if we were to pursue this further. So, I'm sorry. I think I ask questions that may be like too too far far away, and from right now. But I do have another question. I will come back for the second round. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice, Councillor Stevenson. Yeah, thank you. I've I've really enjoyed the the conversation and appreciate everyone's、uh, passion around this.、Uh, just maybe to administration, I just want to clarify the the comments that we heard at、uh, committee the other day regarding commercial requirements in the zoning bylaw. That was primarily ground floor、uh, commercial space. Is that is that right? It wasn't necessarily you know the full you know fifteen twenty thirty stories of development. So I think Kim Petrin, branch manager Kim Petrin, Petrin is online. Might be able to be help help with that question. That's correct, Councillor Stevenson. I think that was the feedback we heard from the speaker that day. Yeah, and so you know, while that's that's not、um, you know something that potentially needs work, it's not necessarily in conflict when we're looking at sort of a a more wholesome conversion of an entire building, for example. I, I would agree. Yeah. Okay,、um, and then just just going back to the impacts on the CRL as well. You know, I think I think it is a good point, just in terms of you know a switch from commercial to residential. But I I just want to go back to that point about the risk of eroding the assessment value of downtown、uh, through vacancies and lack of vibrancy. So again, just want to clarify that that is that is a a, a real concern that if、um, vacancies continue to creep up. Um, we we get to a point where the assessed value of those buildings will go down, and that has the the ability to to negatively impact the CRL returns、um, as well as our our general tax base. Thank you for the question, Councillor Stevenson. To、uh, clarify, this would have an impact on like the、um, the reduction in assessed values due to chronic vacancy. Would have an impact on the CRL. It would not have an impact on the general levy, because、right. of the way assessment and taxation works. When assessed value is reduced in one area,、um, 
there's a redistributive effect to the other area where values have either stayed uh, the same or have increased. So within the municipal tax levy as a whole, there's a redistributive effect and no effect on the city's uh, tax levy. Um, but, but that within the CRL, there would be. Yeah, and that and that redistributive effect though would would effectively mean areas outside of the downtown will be paying higher taxes. Correct. Yeah. So. So there is that, that really significant implication. Okay, well, I, I'll leave it there. Very happy to speak to this when we have uh, gone through the list, but uh, appreciate the move bringing it forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Can also take the chair and Councillor Tang is next in the, in the row. I just got to step out for a minute. Of course. Uh, Councillor Tang, over to you. Great, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I really appreciate the intent of this motion um, uh, to administration. Uh, I'm curious, what's the office, uh, office vacancy rate in 2019? Uh, Alyssa, if you've got that answer, I'm, I don't have that answer in front of me. I don't have that answer either. We'll have to follow up on that, Councillor Tang. Yeah, um, and I'm wondering who, do we know if anybody currently doing any hotel conversion in Edmonton? No, sorry, not hotel, uh, office conversion. Based on some limited um, stakeholder conversations, um, we've got early indication that there's um, exploration of uh, at least one uh, office tower, but no, you know, real tangible movement um, conversations. Though, um, although limited, there have been some. Yeah, um, you know, I, I mean, I. I asked about 2019 because, you know, obviously through the pandemic, we've seen a pretty massive exodus uh, in the downtown office spaces. Uh, people are working from home. The way, um, the way um, uh, working trends are changing, but I also see that trend changing kind of back where there's a lot of policy to invite people back. Um, I guess to the mover, I suppose. How how do you see those kinds of changes affecting the intent of this, or are we going to get to a point uh, where you know this might not, you know, we might go back to say 2019 level, which is a healthy vacancy rate level, um, that this might not be a problem. So tough for me to answer is I'm not the expert in the field, but, I, but I'll say having chatted with some folks who, sure, who yeah. sort of specialize in I was gonna, gonna reframe in that. In that yeah, right it, the, the feedback I've generally heard is that the, I, I've had some flags being raised by folks that are involved in commercial real estates, that this is, this is not just a, a blip for us, this is, if we're not careful, it mm -hmm. could be a, similar to what Calgary faced. So that's what I'm relying on as part of informing this conversation. Calgary is 30%, which I yeah. think oh, yeah. one of the very high, oh, yeah. for sure. Um, and, and I think, you know, there's been lots of chatter about this topic and there was a, a very recent, you know, article as well where there's just a lot of caution in the industry about proceeding on this. And I, you know, I, I absolutely agree that, you know, residential, low residential rate specifically to downtown is is a is a pretty key issue for vibrancy but um i guess i'm i just share a lot of the the concerns my my colleagues have raised but i'll ha i guess i'll have to see kind of the rewording and how that might you know this isn't about limiting to one tool um but maybe you're looking at to come maximize this tool at the same time, you know, knowing that there are other tools. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, yeah, and and uh, and I don't know if administration kind of know this, but based on the conversations with industry, like, you know, isn't my understanding is that these conversions typically take quite a some time, uh, several years, right? And so when you talk about, you know, we're looking at a ten year plan. You know, we're not, I guess I'm just wondering like, how much progress can we realistically make and how, uh, how much, you know, how much conversion can, is that realistically gonna solve the issue here? 
tough to say. I, I, I will say when the construction grant was approved last term, uh, I think it had, and, and I think Ms. McCabe and others have talked about the economic impact, and, and it did spark a lot yep. in a fairly short amount of time. So I think there's potential, but I also don't want to suggest this is going to be the, you know, the silver bullet to solve yeah. everything either. Yeah, and I guess we'll find out more when the report exactly. comes back. Um, and I would, I would expect that administration will have some of those more comprehensive information. Um, yeah, I think I was, you know, I was supportive because we're really looking at an advocacy component, working with our partners. Um, but it, yeah, there's just a lot of, I think, caution that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm seeing uh, based on kind of reporting and what we know right now about this phenomenon. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm back, Councillor Stevenson. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Uh, so, Councillor Nag, you want to reinstate? Yeah, if that's okay. Councillor uh, Hamilton helped put together some good wording. Yeah. I can restate it. Yeah, you can you restate that instead of take this off and put the other one on? Yeah, if that okay. works. Uh, so, yeah. it's in the chat as well for anyone who hasn't seen it yet. So, I would move that administration work with external stakeholders as previously listed to discuss recommendations for increasing the number of new residential and or hotel units in downtown Edmonton, focusing on one, refurbishment of existing residential or conversion of existing office spaces, and two, potential for legislative changes or financial incentives to better achieve this goal. Um, who seconded that, sorry? Councilor Stevenson. Councilor Stevenson. Councilor Stevenson seconded that, okay, good. Um, all right, Councilor Jans, that's it? Uh, okay, let's see where we were uh, in the, were there any other speakers on this? No. Uh, let me see. I, I can't see the list, so. Okay, so we have motion on the floor. Anyone wish to speak? I can, here we go. Uh, here we go. Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you. I'll, I'll just speak very briefly to say I appreciate uh, Councillor Knapp's graciousness in implying that uh, that this was a shared effort. Uh, I just want to thank him for leading this. I think it's a great initiative. Um, and I think it really speaks to the ownership that, that I think all of Council feels uh, for our downtown. Um, it, it is an asset for our entire community and, and impacts all, all neighbourhoods. So I really... Um, really appreciate his efforts on that and, and his, uh, you know, excellent work at, at keeping me informed and, and in the loop of this initiative. So thank you for that. And thank you to everyone today for the discussion as well. Again, really hearing that investment that you all feel uh, for the downtown. I'm really excited to explore um, this, this idea. We've all recognized that we need, need more residential downtown. This is another tool or strategy that we can add to our toolbox, and I'm excited to explore it and learn more about where it can take us. Thank you again to Mover, and I encourage you all to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Paquette. Thank you. Yeah, um, I guess I'm, I'm still like uh, thinking that there should be a second part to this that includes... Uh, that administration explore potential partnerships or opportunities with the federal government and CMHC. I think it's broad enough now. Yeah. Yeah. Because okay. doesn't specifically on only number two mentions that just little changes and doesn't 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 that pertain okay. doesn't pertain. Oh my God, my right. tongue is not twisting. Right. Yeah, I think it's broad enough to include that conversation. Okay, well, yeah. since this council is never pedantic, I will end my questions. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Okay. 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 Uh, Councillor Rice. So I was, go I was going to ask a question, but right now I changed the question to the comment in my speech right, to save the time. Um, I do think um, the downtown vibrancy is important for our city. Uh, I really appreciate the efforts or the in initiative like this and I try to put some possibility and for us to look at how we can strengthen our city's downtown vibrancy. Um, so through this work, I do looking forward to see a few things and that will help us and for the future decision making and because that is involved financial requirements and also involved 
uh, policy change uh, initiative and the process as well. So the few points I would like to say through this work uh, is about the leads assessment. Because the leads assessment is really important for downtown area and specifically if we look at how many, what's the ratio and for the office spaces and the office towers we have and compared to the residential area. And then we have to look at the long term. Yes, for from short term perspective right now, our office spaces vacant, vacancy rate increased a lot. And due to the COVID and due to public safety concerns, due to other type of factors. But everything is changed every day. And our our government and then I believe that from three level government we put lots of effort to address public safety. Uh, safety concerns and also to provide the infrastructure support and for downtown development. Um, so from that to say in a long-term perspective, our downtown's office spaces will keep the same level as we have today. If not, that means after we convert the office spaces to the residential spaces, and then we need more office spaces. That means we have to do another type of development. But from cost effective and from financial perspective, can we look at the opportunity to do this work for that long term and strategic and or systematic analysis in place? And so I really looking forward to see that analysis come back with this initial work. So another point I would like to include in this initial uh, work is about our downtown vibrancy definition. I don't know if our city has a very clear picture and for the downtown vibrancy definition, like for example, how many buildings for residential, how many population residential uh, compared to the business buildings commercial buildings compared to the office spaces buildings. So is there anything there can quantitatively to define what is the downtown vibrancy? So if we don't have that information, we don't have that very clear description or definition of downtown vibrancy, um, I'm looking forward to see that information here. That actually will help us from long-term planning and from cost-effective planning, from re, uh, responsible development perspective, and to support our downtown vibrancy strengths. Thank you. So I will be here on my time. Yep. Thank you, Councilor. Nice, Councilor Nack. Thanks, Mayor Sohi. Uh, thanks so much for all the questions. That was great. I, now I feel like I don't have much to add to close. Uh, I'll, I'll share a few things. So. Um, first, again, thanks to Councillor Stevenson as the as the councillor for downtown. But as, as she noted, we are we are in this together in our downtown. Um, this is oddly something I campaigned on. Uh, so if you go through my platform, which is still available on my website, anyone who's interested, um, uh, part of why I, I campaigned on this is is because of some of what I touched on a bit earlier. I was watching the city of Calgary, and I pulled up the story I linked to um, in in the platform. It was a 2019 story in Calgary, and, and uh, at the time they were uh, sounding the alarm because they saw the rates go up, uh, commercial property tax rates go up about 55% over a four-year period, and that was in 2019. And a lot of that was directly attributed to how their downtown was, uh, vacancy rate was so high, and the assessment values essentially shifted from the downtown core out to all of the other businesses, and they had to make up that lost value. And for the longest time, I, I wasn't as worried about it because if you go back into the history of a number of our meetings, uh, having heard from different experts and different folks that, again, our vacancy rate that we were experiencing was, was different than Calgary, albeit similar in percentage, different in the type. Um, Calgary was almost exclusively in their higher, uh, their A-class buildings. We were in the B and C, as I talked about a bit earlier. Um, and that presented different challenges, but, but not the same type of financial challenges that we were facing. Uh, as, as things have evolved, we're, we're dealing with some, I think, some concerning numbers as those vacancy rates go up. 
And again, I'm not at all suggesting that this motion will somehow be the be all and end all. I think it's one tool that will be done in combination with what was moved at the last executive committee, which is which will be done in combination with the other changes that we're looking at. Um, but I, I think we do need a bit of a, I, I'm not a, you know, just every, looking at this from every single angle, um, because it is quite possible we need to be using a whole host of tools all at once to, to address what we're looking to address and, and create the vibrancy we all seek and to, to build up the downtown population into a place where um, just that sheer volume of people will, will help transform what we're looking at. It will help better support the local businesses that are downtown. It'll help uh, bring in new businesses because they have a, a population base to sustain it. Um, you know, interestingly enough, downtown isn't very different than a lot of our other mature neighborhoods um, in terms of that lack of population to support that local base. And, and that is something where Edmonton is fairly unique. Our population downtown is quite a bit less than you would see in most major urban centers. And that's for a variety of reasons. The fact that we have a very large uh, employment hub in, in the university, uh, oddly enough, even in West Edmonton Mall being one of the largest employment hubs. And that decentralizes our core compared to a number of other areas. Uh, yet we know that, uh, as has been said time and time again, downtown makes up 1% of the area, but 10% of our property tax base. And so if we're not careful, being careful about that, that's how you can end up in the same situation that Calgary was for some time. In Calgary's case, they use essentially their version of the FSR to help offset those increases for year after year after year and essentially kick the can down the road until finally they got hit with a massive property tax increase uh, when they finally had to pay for it and couldn't keep kicking the can down the road. I think we just need to be looking at this and, and uh, as mentioned through some of the questions earlier, this can hopefully come sooner rather than later. Uh, and and I, I actually think this is something the provincial government would be very interested in because again, uh, they might not be interested in the financial incentive side. I'm fine with leaving it in the motion. I didn't want to uh, nitpick about that. But I think they'd be very eager to make legislative changes uh, where, where essentially we can use the existing tools available to us um, that don't have to cost new money and that can help uh, benefit. So interested to see what will come with this. Those organizations are eager to work with us and, and work in partnership with us to go to the province and other groups so that we can make this happen. So. Thanks so much for the conversation. It was great. I wasn't expecting so many questions, but I love it. <laughs> Hope you all support it. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Nack. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. There you go. It's carried. Uh, 10.2, eSports events. Are you expecting yeah, some I, I, more questions on that? Okay, questions. can you move it, please? <laughs> yes, I'd love to. I'm so excited to move this. So, yeah. I will move uh, that administration facilitate an engagement session and work with the Edmonton Screen Industries Office and other relevant stakeholders to, one, review the Alberta eSports strategy for the actions identified in the report that fall within municipal control and within existing municipal budget to provide a report back on the status of implementation, including identification of the leads responsible for implementing municipal actions. Number two, develop a plan for Edmonton to host a mid-sized sports event in the next one to two years, mid-sized esports event in the next one to two years, and a major esports event in the next two to three years, and report back on proposed plans that include identification of the leads responsible for implementation of the esports events. Number three, review existing high-level interactive digital media investment attraction strategy for Edmonton and provide recommendations for programs and incentives to support the strategy and potential funding strategies. Second. So Thank you, Councillor uh, Paquette, for seconding it. Okay, Councillor Nack, to introduce, please. I need seven seconds back. There we go. That's there we go. Can two we minutes start started early. Get, there. Uh, oh, okay. uh, Ten seconds more. Thank you. So uh, sometimes you make motions, uh, you know, wanting to manifest things into existence. Uh, and, and because I think Edmonton has the capability of being the esports leader in this country, if not North America, there was a great body of work that I think we all got, and if you didn't, it came out in December, uh, that was done in partnership with Edmonton Global, the Edmonton Screen Industries Office, post-secondary institutions across this province that showed there is a great opportunity uh, in the province, but I will say specifically in Edmonton with esports, 
which is a massive industry which attracts viewership far greater than things like the Super Bowl and has uh, prize pools far above what you could ever imagine for playing video games. And uh, we have some unique features going on here in the city of Edmonton. While I think, see the city of Calgary and what they've done with film and TV, and we have benefited from some of the residual of that, I see the other half of that work and on the interactive digital media side as an area that is ripe for Edmonton to take the lead on. And part of why uh, I focused on the esports events in one and two is that, as many of you might know, uh, Rogers Place, uh, we actually do get access to it 28 days a year. And that is a facility that can actually host esports events. It was built with some of that in mind. And we don't use all 28 days every year, which is a travesty in its own, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> which is something we should talk about another day about making sure we're using all 28 days available to us. But uh, that also gives us a great advantage if we went to some of these major uh, esports events uh, and said, we have a venue ready to go and it's time for you to be in Canada in an industry where we know we are quite prominent in. So I, I could talk a lot more and I will in the closing around some of the other aspects about point three in the economic strategy piece and why I'm worded it the way it is. Um, and I'll do that in closing. I also want to know there's a whole list of stakeholders that I've listed that I have separate from in the relevant stakeholders that somebody might ask me about and I can share some thoughts on that. Okay, thank you, Councilor Nack. Any questions, please? Councilor Tan. Uh, thank you for, for this motion. Would you like to expand your thoughts on the other stakeholders? Yes, I'm actually pulling up. Uh, so I had done a few different versions of the motion in partnership with administration, but I do want to note uh, that we have the Alberta Esports Asso Association Interactive Arts Alberta, Edmonton Un Unlimited, obviously the ESIO, Edmonton Global, uh, the provincial government because they're included in the Alberta Esports strategy. I think all of them uh, uh, need to be part of this at that initial table so that we can work together to figure out who will then take the lead that probably shouldn't be the city of Edmonton. It will be one of these other groups, but we need them all together. Um, I didn't list them out, but I also wouldn't be opposed to listing them out. So uh, I just wanted to, uh, based off some initial feedback, I didn't include that, so. Yeah, I mean, I think your motion's fairly long, so maybe not listing it out is okay. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, was, I was thinking being more explicit, earing on the side of being more explicit, maybe the better. Um, and then can you maybe talk a little bit about the regional play here? Yeah, I think, um, on the regional side, this uh, obviously in esports events might be, while it might be more centrally focused in the city of Edmonton, the broader um, interactive digital media side, there's a lot of potential. We've obviously got some great, great gaming studios here in the downtown core, but there's other groups doing interactive digital media, and this ties a little more into point three, that don't have to be in the downtown core, that they could be set up in the region. They can, some of the work that they're doing can then be uh, taken through and, and used in other industries. And so, um, I, I mean, I could go on and on, but I don't want to waste your time other than to say, I think this is more than an Edmonton benefit. Uh, this is very much a regional benefit for something like this. Yeah, no, that, that's great. Um, very happy to see this on the table. I'll speak to it when it comes. Thank you, Councilor Tan. Councilor Salvador. Um, my question was basically answered. I was going to ask about some of those stakeholders as well, particularly um, Explore Edmonton, Edmonton Global. Um, but instead, I'll just ask about the, the second point, um, and you started to allude to it, uh, Councillor Neck, but when it comes to the development of the actual plan, um, you, you don't necessarily see that as being housed under the City of Edmonton, or the City of Edmonton playing that lead role, is that correct? Correct. I think okay. our, our major component of hosting an esports event would be likely the use of Rogers Place, uh, and potentially as an introduction to a maybe we look at a low cost or no cost option to use one of our 28 days to attract one of them in to show how successful it can be. But I don't think we should probably be the lead. I think it should be ESIO in combination with Explore Edmonton and these other groups. And again, I don't want to prescribe who it should be. I want them to go to the table and work together to figure out who's the right body to take the lead on the attraction. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Salvador, Councilor Principe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I tried to take myself off the list because my questions were answered. So I'll, I will ask one more question. Are you going to be a participant? If it's, uh, <laughs> if it's Rocket League, yeah, I would definitely give it a try. I'd love to. All right, I'll watch. Thank you. <laughs> That's it for me, thank you. Cool, okay. 
Thank you, Councillor Principe. Uh, before I go to Councillor Rice, I don't know, just, just want to flag this for administration. If they have the answer, I'll ask this question, like how many days we are not using Rogers Place that's allocated to us, if you can find that out. Right. I'll be good information. I'm surprised that we're not using it. Right. Uh, Councillor Rice. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Nack, and for this innovative ideas. <laughs> um, but I do have a few questions. Uh, by looking at the motion, um, I can see the capacity requirements involved from administration to do this work. Uh, so that means two factors here. One is the manpower resources, and one is the existing budget and to do this work. And then I just want to get a clarification from administration which team will take on this, and is do we have the resources uh, with the because we're under review and for the OP12, and then is this our priorities at this moment and to do this work? So, Councillor Rice, the, uh, the team assigned internally to lead this work would be the Economic Investment Services Group, and they do have the capacity and wouldn't be looking for more resources for these initial steps. Uh, but depending on the findings and, and what was brought forward, there would then obviously be um, conversations of what's next in terms of costs. Okay, so that means we, we do have that capacity internally to do this work, to take this initial work first. So, Councillor Rice, uh, administration, uh, economic investment services would work with our partners. So it wouldn't be necessarily all um, city internal work. There would be a lot of work from our partners, the stakeholders that were listed to help develop. Uh, this, that's this wonderful. That is the answer I'm looking for. And it's specifically, yes, uh, from our city, because it's not full capacity and a full responsibility for under our shoulder, and we will have stakeholders and then partnership. And then, but it, what I heard from our stakeholders, partnerships, they're actually funded operationally by our city. Does that mean we have to provide additional operation supports, funding support for them to get into this work? To me? Uh, I don't know to, to you or uh, city administration because I just want to get a clarification uh, on that. I mean, my, my expectation of this is that this is not going to be ultimately led by the city of Edmonton. This is going to be led by yes. the various groups mentioned, and I don't want to spend much else beyond convening that table to, to figure out who's taking and, the lead. And because there are two stages here. The first stage is just doing this work first and then return to us with some fundings. And for the funding's recommendations, the word move to the next step. I'm not ask, ask next step financial cost. I'm asking even for the stage one, when this partnership stakeholder involved, is there a possibility for them to request increased operational funding for them to get into this work? Because I heard clearly, and our administration will use existing funding, existing capacity, and to do this work without asking additional cost. So uh, specifically, I'll start with the eSports part, part one and two to answer that question, because in that eSports strategy, there's a pretty detailed chart of uh, the actions from each group and who would be responsible for what, but most aren't financial in nature. It's more of a um, making sure there's somebody who can take the lead on that work and be a, go a connecting person. But I don't think it has to be, I, I don't foresee a situation where these folks would come back afterwards and say, we need more money to do this. I think it falls generally within the mandate of, right, of a variety of these organizations. It just takes a convening source to make sure it's not being forgotten about. Um, yes, um, I agree your point. And then I just want to make sure, and I did say, with the city has a limited financial resources, we're not facing the additional request uh, for this, for the funding and to support uh, even stage one work. But uh, I, I, I estimate stage two may re come back, require some additional, additional financial uh, requirement to do this work. Uh, yeah. I don't know yet. I just uh, right now to do the initial analysis, but this is question I would like to get clarified. Uh, my next question, and then, 
Councillor, it's certainly true that three of the named partners are funded by the City of Edmonton, but I think until the scope and scale of such an event was uh, determined, it would be hard to know whether or not they would require investment or could take this on under their current mandates and budgets. Okay, thank you. So I will come back for my last question. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Paquette. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, just uh, going to see if administration has an answer to the question that you had previously. It appears that for this year, we've only used one of the 28 days, and that was for the regimental uh, funeral. Uh, part of the constraints around using those 28 days is that it isn't free, uh, that there still are costs associated. Um, so to think that that's just like 28 free days for us to play in isn't the case. Right, with staffing costs and what have you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, a memo would be great if, uh, if we can get that for council, just so we've all got that information. Sure, and uh, just one other thing to add is that uh, there still will be some negotiations required with the Oilers Entertainment Group to secure any of those um, arrangements as well. Yeah. But I can provide that in a memo. Yeah, and if, if there's time, I'd just like to speak to it if there's no more questions. Uh, I, I, are there any more questions on this? Okay, well, I'll come back. Let's is it a process. question that can be answered? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, can you move the second round? Councillor Paquette, can you move second round, please? Yeah, I move second round. Okay. Second. Uh, second by Councillor Knack, uh, right? Please vote. Councillor Rutherford? Give all the votes. Display the votes, please. Okay, that is carried. Okay, uh, Councillor Rice, go ahead, please. Uh, just one very quick question, but uh, Councillor Percati, you said very clear this question may not have the answer. <laughs> uh, specifically, we talk about uh, how um, the, this type of um, events and then from economic outputs to support our city's economic development. Um, do we have specific um, data to demonstrate the return on those type of investment from effort we put on and also from late stage, uh, the financial uh, requirements we put on? And specifically if other cities doing certain things, and then maybe can you comment a little bit more on that? Yeah, I, I think, and again, hard to, hard to answer, but, but I think most of the work, I mean, maybe to try to help alleviate, I think the concern you're having is around wh where, where money might be asked for and, and things like that. And, and I don't foresee, I don't foresee because the mandate of groups like ESIO already include interactive digital media. So I don't think there's, a, there's an opportunity where folks will come back and say we need more. It's just a matter of how are we prioritizing our time within those groups. So I, I don't know if that helps. Like, I, I can't say for sure if they're going to come and, and ask for more, but I can say that for many of these groups, they already have this within their mandate. It's just a matter of making sure somebody owns it and is and is taking the lead on the work. Uh, is there any tangible outputs mm. and um, from support our economic yeah. yes. development in the city? perspective sure so, so you can less a few yeah so in terms of tangible economic outputs I mean it was specifically on the eSports part so focusing on one and two uh, and then I'll answer it in relation to three I mean these these events um, attract and again it's not just the competitors they, they fill up these stadiums so you get folks you know ten, essentially tens of thousands of people who come out to both participate and be spectators in these events. So there's obviously benefits to your hospitality side, there's benefits, to, and these are folks with obviously a lot of uh, usually disposable income if they're taking their time to come out to a major, like a major sporting event, like a FIFA, like a, a Super Bowl, like a Stanley Cup, like a Grey Cup. So there's a lot of economic potential in there, and there's been some numbers that are put in the esports strategy that you can, uh, that, that detail some of that. I just don't have them off the top of my head. Um, to point three, uh, which deals broad, more broadly with that whole industry. 
uh, that's something I see attracting new jobs and investments. So when the other provinces started investing, uh, through the, they had provincial tax credits to allow these industries to grow. Uh, Vancouver, Montreal, Toronto uh, all took advantage because each of their provinces had uh, tax credits to let industry uh, their development companies f set up shop. And so while there was an initial tax credit by the province that was issued on those, obviously now those uh, major studios uh, employ thousands of people in certain cases. Uh, so that's new income tax revenue, that's new employment that, that typically has gone to other cities outside of uh, Canada. But we're seeing more and more of that. We've got Bioware here, which is obviously our biggest, but there is potential with most of these major studios to set up shop here in Edmonton, do the same reasons you would set up a business in Edmonton in any other industry. So there's an economic benefit on the esports side for event attraction. There's an economic benefit on the uh, trying to do a di digital media investment strategy to bring in new development studios here. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the answer. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Okay, now we have motion on the floor. We conclude the questions. Now to, oh, sorry, Councillor. Uh, oh, it's you. Okay, sorry. Uh, uh, I thought I, I couldn't read from here. I thought it was Councillor uh, Prince Bay, right? Sorry. <laughs> I, I should go here on my screen. I usually look at that screen. It's far enough from here. I need new sunglasses. Uh, okay, now everyone has concluded the questions. Now we, to speak, Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I understand the, the pain of bifocals. <laughs> I share it with you. Uh, so I am 100% uh, uh, in support of this motion. Uh, just to throw a few numbers out, um, by 2025, this will be a $1.9 billion dollar uh, industry. Um, between 2019 and 2024, it grew by 7.7 percent, and uh, it averages around 577.2 million viewers. So, uh, I would be ecstatic to see E-Town become the home of esports to bolster our economy. <laughs> And uh, fr frankly, um, th this is on par with some of the, as Councillor Knack referenced, some of the larger events that, uh, that we see globally. Um, and this is an industry that is just going to keep growing. And we have already home to uh, game developers, uh, as referenced, Beamdog, uh, um, Bioware, and this can be opening the door for more of that um, entertainment knowledge economy and how people invest and see Edmonton. And frankly, I, for one, would be ecstatic for young people to see Edmonton as this center of, uh, of the things that they are passionate about. And they want to come to Edmonton. In fact, I wish there was a documentary starting right now from this initial motion, The Road to Edmonton, The Road to Glory. Uh, I think that would be great. Uh, but. Uh, you know, we won't have the boys on the bus, but we'll have the boys with the e-bus, if anyone knows their computers. Okay, I'm done. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor <laughs> Tang. Uh, okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much to the mover for bringing this forward. Um, you all mentioned Bioware, so I'm not going to repeat that. Uh, but I will say, I think it was, this was during the pandemic. You know, eSports is fairly a new thing to me. Um, I don't play, but I, I have certainly heard a lot about it. And during the pandemic, I had the opportunity to really learn about uh, eSport Expos um, from, I think, ASA, Alberta eSport Association. Um, and was, what I would really particularly struck me was how much uh, an expo of that scale, uh, organized pre-pandemic, had the impact of um, bringing kids out of their shell and like drawing people from not just Edmonton, but like the region and other smaller towns and municipalities um, and having a space where uh, you know young people uh, are doing the things that they're really passionate about, uh, young people of all kinds of backgrounds, um, and uh, and you know the 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 people in the industry is young. Uh, it's a it's a huge uh, growing industry, and I think. Um, 
you know, when ESI, when ESIO came to budget in December, I, I, in my question to them, I raised the Alberta eSports strategy. And one of my questions is, how are we leveraging that? How are we going to be building upon this momentum? Um, and so for some reason, I just thought it was going to happen. And I, I, I actually really appreciate you being very intentional and uh, making sure that there is a conversation that's happening, um, that, it, that it will happen. And, you know, on top of that, I, I also appreciate that you um, emphasize the role of the city as a facilitator, as a catalyst. We don't have to do everything. In fact, the expo has been organized by people not from the city very successfully on massive scale um, many times before, the recent one being February. Um, and I'm sure we can get some economic indicators around uh, the the impact that that one event has generated, um, and you know, and I think that's and I think that's important. Uh, we I think since um, you know since you know things have opened up, we've been talking a lot about bringing tourism back, bringing various events back. Um, we've seen the impact from things like Junos from um, and some other large scale events. Uh, and the and the impact on on local industry, um, and I think this should very much be part of that conversation. And I'm glad to see this being a bigger, playing a bigger role. Um, uh, I just found out read today that there is now an esports section in the Edmonton Sports and Social Club. I, I was part of that before. I did not know this is now a thing. Uh, so just sort of indication of the spread of the sport. Um, yeah, so very much supportive of this. And I, uh, you know, I think convening, uh, I think is something we should be doing, um, you know, within our, um, within our current role. So yes, I, I support this and thank you for, uh, for moving this motion. Okay, Councillor Tang and now Councillor Nack to close. First, I realized we didn't have a date, and I, my goal is sort of January. Um, uh, this would take a bit of time to start that body work and report back. January so. 2024, yeah. first quarter 2024. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, so first of all, thanks everyone for your questions, your comments, uh, really appreciate that. Um, I, I don't, I don't want to uh, spend too much more time on the eSports piece other than to say the expo that Councillor Tang was just talking about. Uh, when the organizers started that up, they were expecting to get about 400 people. They were That was their sort of like hope. They got 2,500 people um, and from across this province. And in that expo, you got uh, Vimy Ridge Academy had their eSports program on display along with all of the post-secondary institutions. This is, this is an industry that is uh, massively being supported now by, by post-secondaries and schools and it's places that folks can train in. So I uh, just want to flag that, that piece of it and, um, and I'm really excited about the opportunity for events. I think Edmonton is, is very well suited to be uh, a great host city for esports events and I think we could really take the lead in, in North America truly on this if, we're, if we do this right. But again, I don't think the city of Edmonton as an organization should do this. We should use our venue that we have access to. Well, I know it's not entirely free, but um, we should use that, that benefit that we have to help uh, bring in events. Uh, I didn't spend much time on point three that I actually want to spend more time on now. I was hoping point three would have been moved uh, in addition to the interactive digital media tax credit that had been rumored was going to be in the provincial budget. Unfortunately, it did not get approved. Minister Glubish at a Ch Edmonton Chamber event recently talked about this and, and they are doing work to ideally create the business case to authorize that. And my hope is that within the year, they will have, uh, whoever is the provincial government after the election will have the interactive digital media tax credit because I, I truly believe uh, that, as I mentioned at the opening, this interactive digital media uh, can be what film and TV is to Calgary and Southern Alberta right now, but we can do that here in Edmonton and in Northern Alberta. Um, because even without that credit, you know, not only do we have Bioware, which is now owned by a major development company, Electronic Arts, and Inflection Games that was opened by a former general manager of Bioware that was then bought by Chinese company Tencent, and we have Beamdog, and we have a number of other smaller uh, indie studios that are here. Uh, we have great potential in this area, and, and the story, and I think I've shared it here, but just maybe once more, is that 
when gaming started to pick up in Canada, it, it actually started with a phone call from the mayor of Montreal at the time to the U Ubisoft CEO in France. And it just took a call to say, I mean, it, it's not that simple, but it took a call from the mayor saying, you've got the studio that operates out of France, you know, we're a French speaking province, why not look to set up a, a, another branch of your studio here in Canada? We've got great opportunity and it took some time, but ultimately set up. And that has really helped to expand the gaming development industry across Canada. And I think once we have the interactive digital media tax credit, which will put us on par with BC and Ontario and Quebec, we can then go out. And, and part of why I suggested January is that I want to see us next year in 2024 out at the Game Developers Conference in March, out at all of the major gaming exhibition groups in partnership with ESIO and Edmonton Global, going to meet with these developers and saying, we've got the tax credit, we've got the better, better cost of living than any of those other cities I've just listed, we've got the quality of life your staff would love, it's time to set up in Edmonton now too. I mean, it is an industry that, that, a that has employs thousands upon thousands of people in each of these cities, and um, we have so much to offer here in Edmonton, and I, you know, obviously I'm, I'm personally passionate about this industry, it's an industry I've followed for a long time, but it, it surpasses film and TV in terms of overall economic output. Um, so I hope that in partnership with the province, once that's in place, we are ready to go as Team Edmonton out into, uh, out into the world and get people setting up here, setting up new studios, at the same time attracting new big events uh, in the esports world, which will help showcase Edmonton to all of these potential development studios. This is something we can truly do in partnership, and, and I think the province will get behind it. Uh, the chamber sent a letter to all of us this morning. Uh, they, they're on board. We've got every partner willing to work with us together, uh, and, and I think the sky's the limit on, on uh, interactive digital media and esports in particular. So uh, let's get to work. Thank you. Thank you, Konstantinak. Please vote. Give all the vote. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, notices of motions or motions without customary notice. Nope. So can we just, so just a wee clean up, so there was still an agenda item from Councillor Rice on 10-3, so can we just, to clarify that that's not going to be put forward anymore? Uh, I thought we'd done that part of the agenda approval, but still, if you... That was an inquiry. I just don't have the authority to ignore agenda items. Okay, so just uh, for the record, please. So 10.3 Council Advisors for Advisory Committee's roles and responsibilities. I'll go go to Council Rice to kind of withdraw it, right? Or is that she doesn't need to withdraw. Just to clarify for the record that she's not. So Council Rice, motion. can you please clarify that for the record? Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. Because that motion right now, I know it already moved as a Council inquiries, so we don't need to move. I don't need to move anymore. Okay, all right, that's on the record. Uh, now, notice some motions and motions without customary notice. Yes, yes I have one, Mr. Mayor. Oi, uh, Councillor Stevenson. As to I, so I'll wait. Councillor Stevenson, go ahead, please. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, at the April 17th, uh, 2023, City Council meeting, I plan to move that administration bring forward a report to committee providing background and outlining the tax forgiveness options for the YWCA with tax amounts assessed in 2022 at 104-08-104th Street, account 9948253. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Any other notice of motions or motions without customer? Yes, yes, Mr. Mayor. Yes. All right, so at the uh, April 17th, 2023 City Council meeting, I will move the following. That administration provide a report outlining the following information. One, a current inventory, status, and history of agreements between the City of Edmonton and homeowners associations in Edmonton relating to the city acquiring properties from a homeowners association. And two, a summary of the process and cost benefit analysis for the city to acquire the properties from the River Point HOA. Okay. 
Okay. Any other notes of motions or motions without customary notice? See, in none. We are adjourned at 321.